What's up, man? Welcome. What's up, man? Thanks for having me out here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so for people who don't know who you are, give me like a brief background on uh, how you got into filmmaking and how you got into creating all these podcasts. Yeah. So my name is Payne Lindsay. Um, I've been filming stuff my whole life. And 2016, I decided to make a true crime podcast and go investigate a missing persons case in my home state of Georgia. And I just started poking around a cold case and six months into the podcast, there was a huge break in the case. And from that point forward, I basically forged this company, which is Tinderfoot. And we have 20 plus titles now and a, a whole slew of true crime podcasts about a whole bunch of different cases. Mm. What made you want to start creating these audio podcasts? They're like audio documentaries, right? Yeah. Like they're, I mean, they're similar to like Serial or like Shit Town, those other podcasts that go deep into like, like episodic story breakdowns. It was actually Serial that gave me the idea. I, my friend had showed me this podcast. He's like, hey, I, I know it's like an audio thing, but I think you're going to like it. And uh, we were on a little road trip together for the weekend, and we were driving back from Louisville to Atlanta, and we just binged through Serial. And I was super compelled by it. I thought it was uh, really immersive, and I kind of just forgot that I wasn't watching anything. Mm -hmm. And I, it kind of gave me the idea, I mean, hey, I, I think you can make something super interesting and uh, a deep dive into something through this medium. And that's kind of where the idea for Up and Vanish, my first podcast, really kind of started. Yeah, what do you think it is about those podcasts? Because they're so fucking compelling when you listen to them. It's like you can't stop, but it's you're you're removing all of the video element to it, and it's just audio. I think that because there's a missing visual component, there's kind of like this relationship between the listener and, I guess, the narrator or the host, mm -hmm. where it kind of feels a little bit more personal. It feels like you're kind of a fly on the wall sometimes, and if it's an investigative thing, it feels like you're kind of like right there with me or you're right there with them. And I think that that is like a special thing that podcasts can especially do that maybe visual stuff doesn't really, doesn't really do that. It's because that layer is removed. It kind of makes you use your imagination. Oh yeah. And there's kind of a closeness. I think you kind of grow from that. Yeah. That's a good point. You do have to use your imagination. Yeah. Cause I remember when I, I listened, I listened to probably like the first six or seven episodes of up and vanished in the last couple of days. And uh, when I finally watched a couple of videos on YouTube about it, it was not what I had in my head at all. Like when I saw the, the lady's house and I saw the glove, it's like I had a completely different picture in my head. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so when you're creating these audio documentaries, do you have to go like above and beyond with the audio? Do you have to like add way more to it just because it's audio to make it hit or... I mean, I don't think that you have to do that. I think that that's the approach that I've taken because I felt that that was necessary. Like come from like a filmmaking brain and visually forward thinking, I, th I wanted to create a world that was a soundscape immersive that felt like you were actually somewhere that took you somewhere. And so that's kind of the only way I knew how to do it. And so that's, that's sort of evolved since my first episode of anything. But um, there's plenty of shows that don't even take that approach that are wildly successful, I think, just because the host connects well with the listener. Yeah, it seems like a very fun thing to do, too. It because, is very fun. Because, like, if you could just go... Like, that's one of the things I love about making documentaries is just going, showing up somewhere and hitting the record button and letting it happen. And when you get to do that with just a couple of fucking microphones, it sounds like it's so much easier. That's, you know, that, to me, is the, the most attractive part of podcasting is, you know, I love... TV, I love filmmaking, but there's so many components to that, and it takes forever, and the film industry is super difficult, but if I'm making my own podcast documentary, I can literally, like you said, just go hop in the car, drive to this person's house, press record, and we're, we're doing something, and we're in full control of what we're creating. Do you feel like you get more out of people when you just have a microphone and no camera? Absolutely. I think that... Plenty of people are sort of intimidated by, you know, obviously a film crew rolling up to your doorstep. That's yeah. going to be a little spooky to most people. Um, it's a lot more, I guess, discreet and sort of disarming if it's just like, hey, like, you know, let's just sit down and have a conversation. Maybe you'll forget that we're even doing that. We're just actually, it's just me and you now. Mm -hmm. And so you came from a traditional filmmaking background. Like, what, what were you doing for work before you started doing the podcast? So I was actually uh, directing music videos full time. And um, it's actually how I met my business partner. He actually managed an artist in Atlanta. 
So for years I was doing, you know, some pretty like high budget stuff eventually for the record labels. And then I started getting burnt out. You know, the, the music video thing to me originally was just supposed to be a stepping stone to try to make a TV show, to make a, my own movie. And I was getting burnt out as a freelance creator, you know, struggling to make ends meet financially with what I was doing. And so I, I kind of got it in my head that I needed to make something on my own again. And that's when this idea for a true crime documentary came to my head. And I was like, well, I can't really make that the way I want to. I don't feel like raising money. I don't feel like half-assing this. Mm. And so I was like, well, what if I made a, a podcast that was you know, just as compelling as a proof of concept, really? And then maybe that will grab the attention from the right people connect the dots to do the bigger thing. It's so much different making a music video than it is for making a, a telling a story, right? There's there, like one of my favorite things that what got me into filmmaking was music videos. And that's what I loved. They're that's, fun. That's still, if I could think about it, like if I could pick any profession, I would just want to be, make music videos and get rich making music videos. I wouldn't want to do this <laughs> because it's easy, right? It's fun. It's like, it just flows when you can put music to some sort of visuals. It's just like, there's nothing words can do to make it good. It's just a feeling you get. Yeah. It's a short and sweet yeah. delivery of, you know, making that song come to life right mm -hmm. and uh yeah you're right it's easy to get burned out in that industry because there's it's like a big bureaucracy and a, it's a crazy ladder you have to climb of ass kissing and trying to get more jobs and stressing in between the jobs and the liberation that comes with creating your own content and being able to self-publish it is very different and yeah, it's way better it's priceless i mean that's like as a creator if that's if you're a creator at heart like i am then that's almost more valuable than anything else right mm -hmm. just to be able to create at your free will and it matter or like be a part of your job or your life in a serious way is like really the ultimate goal for me yeah, me too. When I was uh, when I first worked in film in the film industry, working on you know various studio sets and and shooting documentaries and feature films, it was just I saw that this was a, a weird world that I didn't initially expect because it's all I ever wanted to do was be a part of that world. And then when I got there, I realized that I'm just surrounded by a bunch of carnies with dental plans. <laughs> that don't see their families ever, maybe sure. once a year. And mm -hmm. They're just traveling. They get to travel the world, right? But they're alone. They don't see their wife, their kids, their friends. They they live out of a fucking truck. Yeah. And uh, when I saw that, that's when I kind of realized that I wanted to start doing my own shit. And, um, you know, it's sometimes when you when you get something and you, you kind of arrive somewhere where you feel like that was your goal to get there, you realize this isn't all it was cracked up to be there's probably way more than this yeah and i think that that just comes from experience right yeah. um you you lived it you did it you took a shot at it and then you realized or came to the realization yourself that shit i, I want more than this. this isn't this isn't what it was cracked up to be hmm. and that's when you probably had to make your own decision to create something like this right like mm -hmm. go out on a limb and take a risk and try to create something on your own that is sustainable so Up and Vanish, was that your first project that you did independently? That was uh, my very first podcast. And, you know, I went into it pretty much blindly. At the time, it was, you know, Serial was huge, but there weren't a lot of other podcasts in that exact vein. Right. Where they were just like a, a deep dive investigative narrative that felt like a documentary or a movie. Um, and so there wasn't really much of a blueprint for me to go off of. And so all I really did was I tried to make a show that I would want to listen to. And so, and I still, to this day, kind of do that. And I try to not really look around to what everyone else is doing all the time or you know study that too much. Because I think that I've got to a point where I like kind of learning from my own mistakes and taking my own risks. And I don't want to be tainted by you know what someone else says you should be doing or something that's working for somebody else maybe doesn't work for me mm. yeah there's not a lot of podcasts like that right there's there's really not there's like, more now the recent sure. one that I, the most recent one that i've listened to other than yours is the one about um elizabeth holmes mm -hmm. the lady who scammed everyone in silicon valley with her blood thing that she had yeah it's crazy yeah that one was really good too yeah and a long yeah 
there's I mean there's at this point there's tons of great podcasts like that. Yeah. What how long does it take to do it though? Because creating a documentary takes a long fucking time. It's a lot of work, a lot of driving, a lot of especially if you're bringing people with you to help you be, you know, camera assistants, audio people, whatever it may be, that it's it's monotonous. There's just so much thinking that's involved in making a podcast like that. If you're if you're doing a story on a cold case and the premise is that I'm going to go to this town and try to figure out what happened. There's so much thinking involved and so many different pieces to the puzzle that have to be figured out in your own brain and then sort of shaken down and put in a digestible mm. form for a listener. And so that process just takes forever. And what I've learned and you know how my team has gotten better at working is we're really kind of quick thinking and we don't really overthink it we just kind of pull the trigger and go with the gut right. you can always go back and change stuff but if you get stuck on one little facet of something you might miss out on something you didn't know was around the corner because you're still working on that thing that didn't really matter in the first place right mm -hmm. so i like to think just like let's just go do this thing learn from our mistakes and just kind of keep it moving and yeah. be okay with that one of the things I like about doing these types of podcasts is that there's absolutely zero editing, zero B-roll, and zero music you have to do. You just record it and you publish it, no matter how dumb you sounded, <laughs> right. no, matter what, no matter what happens. <laughs> Beautiful. And that's what I love about it. Is that a similar tactic to what you take, or do you put a lot of... How much time, I guess this is a better way of asking, how much time do you spend on between recording and actually publishing one of the episodes? So I actually admire what you're doing. I, I, I'm actually kind of jealous a little bit. <laughs> um, but I mean, we, we do a similar thing. We'll, we'll, we'll sit down with somebody, right? Um, but we, we take that tape and we kind of, you know, whittle it down to the best of the best of the best right. and put it as like a component in a larger story. Um, and so like, it's this, like we get the information so you have, the you same have the way story laid out already. You have the beginning yes. and already figured out. Yeah. We have an entire outline okay. and, and backbone to, I mean, what would normally maybe even be a script, right. For a, a TV series. And we're kind of plugging and playing, but also it's a living, breathing thing. If it's a documentary, there's so much that's out of your control. Mm -hmm. You might think it's going to go this way. You might think that person's going to answer the phone when they don't. And so you kind of have to safeguard yourself and plan around this real life thing mm -hmm. and try to shape the best result for not only you know the case itself and the victim's family but also like as a listener a satisfactory ending or something that felt like it, this was worth having listened to mm. so but in like the case of up and vanish when you released every single episode I, that you were obviously that was a long time ago yes when, when you were doing that like between episode one two three four five six did you already have everything like in the can and edited before you released it? Or were you still in between episode two and three going out there and getting new shit? That was like my ultimate training as a podcaster. Uh -huh. um, and I don't really do it that way anymore. But I was really at the time making Up and Vanish week to week mm. to the point where it would be, you know, Sunday night and I would get a phone call from somebody. I would record it edit it, put music to it, and it would be in Monday morning's episode. And then as a result of that, That's someone cool. on Tuesday is responding to this. And so it was kind of building on itself when this mm -hmm. case was on fire. It was the, you know, one of the biggest news stories in Georgia and kind of just, you know, this snowball effect of everyone's talking, truth's coming out. Mm. We shook the trees and now we're kind of just capturing what's happening around us. That's cool. That's cool because then you get like a vibe that this, th this thing is not super produced or overly produced to where it seems fake. Yeah, it, it was very real in that sense, but mm. I was going kind of the extra mile to kind of p frame it and put it in a way for you where it felt sort of premium. Like it was, even though that call just happened right. last night, it's playing out like it's, you know, in some Showtime documentary right. or like, or yeah. that was my goal was to make it feel that way. Mm. When you uh, released the first episode of the show, what was that? What was that process like for you? Was um, that the first time you ever published anything you ever made online? No, it was okay. the first time I, I published a podcast, and I was yeah. I was really kind of in my head about it a little bit because you know, throughout my whole you know life and career, I'd, I'd identified as a 
a filmmaker, right? And I, I looked at radio and podcasts as like a different beast. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to come onto the scene and be like, hey, I, I do this now. I kind of felt a little like imposter syndrome about it. Um, so much so that I, I was convinced that no one would like my voice. And everyone always says that. But I really was like, I, I don't ha have that kind of voice. I mean, that's what someone in radio has, right? Like, if that was the case, I would have been doing that already or something. Right. And so I was really kind of uh, timid and <clears throat> a little nervous putting it out. But the response in the first week was pretty positive. And I, I remember it was, I got 5,000 listens on the first episode. And I was like, that's huge because that's more, you know, followers than I have on social media, more friends than I have on Facebook. So I was like, you know, something's clicking here. And I just kind of kept making a show that I, I was sort of teaching myself how to make in that process. When you uploaded the episode, where'd you post it? I used uh, some old website. I think it's not even around. Maybe it was called Podbean or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I've heard of that. Um, yeah, I just kind of like found my own hosting. Also, back then in 2016, it was... So you didn't post like just the audio on YouTube or anything. You only posted it on the audio platforms. I only posted on the audio platforms. I was trying to get it in the same places that I found, you know, Serial okay. and the other podcasts that I was looking at. I was trying to sort of frame it to be next to these shows. Like, hey guys, there's another one of these. Mm. I was, there were visual components to it, but it was all like trailer stuff. We, we actually shot a, on the last music video that I did, it's still the last one I've done to this day, we rented a film camera and we kept a couple extra reels to film like a, a visual trailer for Up and Vanished. And I kind of wanted to put out something that felt super premium and suspenseful that would make you think, is this a new Netflix series? What is this? And right. It's like, oh, no, no, it's just a podcast. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what? But that was kind of my approach to it. Mm. And how did, so your first episode got 5,000 downloads or whatever. How did you, uh, how did you promote that? How long did that take for that to sort of take off? It, it happened pretty quickly. I mean, the first couple of weeks I was targeting the actual town itself, Osceola, Georgia. I was paying for like Instagram ads of this okay. visual trailer that I had and was really just targeting it to people who were right here because they would definitely know this case. Right. And so they would definitely be interested in this. Mm. And like once the townspeople kind of got wind of what was going on, it sort of snowballed from there. And then a month or so into it, there was a, a an audience that was significantly larger than just the town. Mm. And it was becoming something that was a little bit more zeitgeisty and um, had, had a little bit of a buzz to it. And that just kind of kept going. And I never knew what the ceiling would the, of that would be. Never knew if this was even going to make any money. I was still looking at it like a stepping stone to do some other thing. And then after you posted that first one, how long did it take for you to post the second one and for this thing to really get viral? So after the first one, I from that point forward, I, I was publishing them every week. Um, Every, I think it okay. was every Monday. Okay. And, um, you know, barring a few off weeks that I kind of took because I was just in the weeds. But, um, you know, I made episode one and I had not even started episode two. <laughs> and in the week between one and two, I made episode two. And that's how I kind of, you know, continued the rest of the show, which I do not recommend for anyone to do it that way. But at the time, it's what I was dealing with. And, I was still kind of trying to figure out what the hell I was doing, really. I think that's the best way to do it. I mean, there's something to it. I, I will say, like, it, the results are special. Uh -huh. But it's, um, you know, I, I really, I lived in this case, in this story, in this podcast, every day of my life for a year and a half. Like, quite literally. Mm. And that was intense. So, I guess we should explain it for people who don't know it. What is the premise of Up and Vanished? And how, how did you decide to report on this thing so um up and vanished season one is about a missing person named tara grinstead who was a high school teacher in osceola georgia she mysteriously vanished in 2005 and it was a a huge unsolved case in georgia it was one of the top 10 unsolved cases on the georgia bureau of investigations website and the circumstances were, were weird she had left this barbecue and she went to uh, her house, allegedly, they found her car in the driveway, uh, cell phone inside, 
door is locked, but she's just gone. And it was like, how does that happen in this tiny place? And then there was a whole myriad of uh, different persons of interest, but none of them really added up. And so the rumor mill started going in South Georgia for years and years. And it was almost like a urban legend at this point. It was totally, you know, had captured, you know, the lives of everyone in the town. And when I came into it, you know, almost 12 years later, I was kind of starting from scratch and as a total outsider, just went to this town and started talking to people and asking questions as some city guy who has a a microphone and apparently makes a podcast. Mm -hmm. And I just tried to use that to my advantage, even though some people were like, are you serious? Who is this guy? Mm -hmm. There was also a level of like, well, it's a little easier to talk to you than it may be the police or, you know, Dateline with all the cameras they have. And so I just tried to lean into the sort of uh, amateur nature of what I was doing to build some trust with people in the town. So who specifically tipped you off on this exact on this specific case and what made you decide on on going to this town and, and starting here? I just had decided that I was going to make a true crime documentary and I was going to investigate a cold case in my home state. Okay. This was probably arguably the biggest cold case in Georgia at the time. And so I started poking around and a few weeks into it, I realized that, you know, my grandma of all people was like best friends with one of the last people to see Tara alive. And so this kind of, there was this weird sort of closeness. And at the time, I was looking for any signs that this was the, the right thing for me to be doing. Mm. And so I looked at that like, hey, I mean, if my grandma is, you know, giving me tips or, <laughs> you know, like That's amazing. talking to me about <laughs> real shit in this uh, case, then maybe that's a sign that I'm going the right direction. At least I feel a little bit better about it. Mm-hmm. And so I just leaned into that and just kept going. And like, what sort of like, how did this thing become cold? And why do you think that this case just got like put on the back burner and forgotten about? I think that in the early stages, it was, I mean, it it was just a damn good mystery, really. Was there corruption? Like, was there cover ups by police inside job? What what, what do you think it was? I, I think that just what they saw didn't make any sense. There were probably some mistakes made early on. There was a way for them to have figured this out back in 2005, and that was in their case file. There was, uh, there were rumors, and there were, you know, accounts on record about these two guys, Ryan Duke and Bo Dukes, who ultimately were discovered as the, you know, m- who murdered Tara. And there was a report about them out here on this pecan orchard burning Tara's body. And I think that it was just so preposterous sounding that these former high school students, super young, one would even be anywhere near Tara and definitely not doing this, right? Mm. And so I think they just kind of turned a blind eye. But there you go. Ten years later, now now they're looking at ex-boyfriends, you know, going through her love life and it's the neighbor, it's this guy, and it's just this classic, you know, finger pointing in a small town. I love how you did it too. Like I was on episode three Mm -hmm. last night when I was finishing episode three, I was like, holy shit, it's definitely this ex-boyfriend who did it. Like without a doubt, there's no way there's this guy who was overseas in Iraq and his girlfriend's here, you know, jumping around town, being a little feral cat. And he comes back, he's jealous and he wants to kill her. Like I was, I was convinced. And then like you, you freaking you next episode, you're like, "Uh, I could be wrong. Yeah. That's great. How you did that. And that's really kind of, that's how I felt. It's like, I I really had no idea who killed Tara, what happened to her. I knew that she didn't run off on her own Mm -hmm. and I would just go down these different rabbit holes with different people and you could find stuff that, that did look weird objectively. Right. But it would never go all the way there. It, It could never like close the loop. And Mm -hmm. that was problematic. And then we learned halfway through the season that there were these other guys over here this whole time. And really, so the the second half, not to spoil it for you, but the second half of the show is really kind of a different podcast. It's covering the live, you know, 
as the the breaks in the case are happening, as they're making arrests and new information's you know coming to light, mm. it's kind of unpacking the story of these guys and what really happened. So, uh, as far as like the, the place that I'm at, the thing that I remember most r- recently that I listened to was the part where there was a house that burned down and there was no reason why. It was an abandoned Snap house. Snapdragon Road. Snapdragon yep. Road, right. There uh-huh. was no reason the house would have burned down, but there was a car there that shouldn't have been there. And the dogs, the guys, you, you were talking to the guy who had the dogs that were supposed to, the cadaver dogs. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you talked to the fire marshal and they were like, what? How did I not hear about this? Like you were finding whole, like massive holes in this burnt down house. Story. Yeah. And I, they, at that time I was like, you know, each time I found something like that, I was like, is this it? This might be it. And it just turned out to be a red herring. That was weird, but it never went any further than that. But you could tell just even going back and exploring these things that there was, there was stuff that was missed or stuff mm-hmm. that had a, a big question mark on it still. And mm-hmm. so I kind of, you know, took on the mindset that, you know, even if I don't solve this, which, you know, w- my goal was to solve it, but I didn't think that that was possible, really. Mm-hmm. I could at least sort of bring clarity and rule things out, right? Mm-hmm. So there's so many cops involved and all the cops know each other. Mm-hmm. And there's that creepy old cop who was, I don't know how old he was when he was at her house, but it seemed like he was way older, mm-hmm. who was uh, HD was his initials, Dix or whatever. Heath Dykes. He's, Heath Dykes, yeah, yep. yeah. He was at her house. And Business car on the door. Very suspicious. And there was like, he had made a bunch of phone calls to her. Yeah. And so, so how did basically the little world, you, the little like bubble you were searching between all the cops and the ex-boyfriends, how did that transition into these other guys these duke guys because you didn't mention these these duke guys haven't been mentioned at all in the first six episodes no so early on you know so maurice godwin the uh forensic psychologist guy who right had you know private investigator who had worked this case forever mm-hmm. who i met in episode one yeah um he stays throughout the series um uh, back in the day uh, i mean he he was here on the ground like early on mm-hmm. and before the podcast came out, I was having many discussions with him about, you know, who who you think did it, who I thought did it, and super early on, we were actually looking at this photograph of these former students of Tara's, and we were talking about the possibility of it being a former student who killed Tara, and I remember thinking at the time, I was like, that just sounds like I don't have anything really like grounded with that. And I feel like if I start going down this avenue of suggesting that maybe she had these, you know, peculiar relationships with her students, that would be really insensitive. Well, and, she did, right? I mean, you talk about it earlier. And then on. We, we discover later that she actually did. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of just put that on the back burner and I focused on everything that had been covered before. All the documentaries that had talked about this case, you know, the names they brought up. Anthony Vickers, Heath Dykes. Anthony, you, he's the one. Yeah, I remember you specifically, you were interviewing him and it was on, you recorded it and you were like, did you have a relationship with her? He's like, yeah. He's like, was it sexual? He's like, huh, yeah. <laughs> right. I was like, <laughs> fuck yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, he said that? And like, that was always like a rumor and no one had ever seemingly asked that guy point blank if right. that's what was going on. And at least that was, that mystery was dispelled. It didn't probably look great for him at the time, but you know, Turns out he had nothing to do with it at all. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that it was just step by step kind of peeling back the onion layer and finding, you know, this little nugget and that little nugget. And then it was all of a sudden in February 2017, out of nowhere, they have a press conference in Osceola at the courthouse announcing that they arrest a guy named Ryan Duke, who was a former student of Tara's for her murder. Pardon this brief interruption, but I want to take a second to talk about our sponsor, Verso. Now, if you've heard this podcast before, chances are you already know how obsessed I am with health and longevity, which is why one of my favorite guests to have on the show is nutritional scientist and neuroscientist, Dr. Dom D'Agostino, who actually introduced me to this stuff. Verso is a company that is dedicated to translating scientific breakthroughs into products that hold the potential to increase longevity. The problem with aging is we accumulate these zombie cells or old damaged cells that linger beyond their useful life. These zombie cells infect other healthy cells, speeding up the aging process, causing things like hair loss, wrinkles, arthritis, cancer, dementia, and everything in the realm of aging. What scientists have realized is that we can manually induce autophagy, 
meaning the cleanup process of the old zombie cells and replacing them with new ones. Verso's new clean being, which I take every night, is a powerful blend of synolytic molecules that help promote the body's natural cleanup processes like autophagy and apoptosis, promoting better cellular health, supporting lower inflammation and natural cardioprotective functions, while boosting protection against age-related diseases. The three main ingredients in clean being are spermidine, lutolin, and dehydrocorsetin, which play key roles in the control of gene expression and are essential for cell growth and proliferation. Specifically, when it comes to cardiovascular and cognitive function, skin health, vision, and the immune system. Head on over to ver.so and use the coupon code CONCRETE at checkout to save 15% on your order. I linked it all below. Now back to the show. There everyone goes, who the hell's Ryan Duke? What? And was never on their radar, so they say. And it was a total out of left field. And so it was that day that I had to make a decision. Am I going to leave it here? And, you know, hang up this story for now, my coverage of this? Or am I going to lean in even more to all the things that I'm hearing on the ground that are saying, hey, I don't think it was just this guy. It was this other guy, too. And sure enough, weeks later, he's arrested. And we kind of go down this path of looking into both of their lives and, you know, were the roles reversed? And there's a lot of evidence to support that. And so it became like these cops screwed up, let this guy get away with this for over a decade. And are they screwing up again? Mm. So you personally, through your investigations, had no crumb trail leading to these Duke guys. I had at all. never heard of Ryan Duke in my life. But what's funny is that picture that I was referring to, right? Back when I was considering looking into the angle of former students. The other suspect, Bo Dukes, who some believe had a larger role in her murder than he's saying, um, he was, he's in this picture. And so like, all these guys that are, are in this picture with this truck are the guys that they were all hanging out with, the guys that were at the parties at the pecan orchard. The same friend circle, it was kind of right there. I just had zero clue and zero context to to keep going down that direction. But it's crazy that all the people you talk to, none of them mention these guys. No, it's crazy. I, I think that it was really a very well-kept secret, and those who did know something, A, didn't want to believe it, and B, uh, were too scared to say a damn thing. And it wasn't very many people who knew, but law enforcement had the opportunity in 2005 to put this whole case to rest mm. and at least interview them, you know, arrest them under suspicion of something and it would have been over, but they just kind of let it go. And then it fell between the cracks. And now this case file is this tall and it's just one little file buried in there. But that was the answer. So when they, when they brought him to trial and when you said it was 2017, uh, well, he was arrested in 2017. He was arrested. He, the trial was postponed and postponed. Didn't even happen until last May. Okay. And I was actually subpoenaed. And I, they were really just doing that to fuck with me. They didn't want me in the courtroom. Right. But we rebutted and filed some other thing and basically said, hey, I, I'm a journalist. You can't restrict me from being able to cover this public mm. case. Right. And so they, they backed off and... I ended up going for a day or two in the final days, but he, you know, after a two week trial, he was found not guilty. So why did they arrest him in the first place? Because, um, because the other guy, Bo Dukes, his friend came to the police on his own with this story that Ryan had killed her and that he had helped Ryan burn Tara's body. And so that's how it all started. And then when they finally went to scoop up Ryan, he's messed up. He's like disheveled. Looks like he's on drugs or something. They take him straight to the station. They put a recorder down and they ask him to ask him to confess. And he does. He confesses. But turns out the stuff he was confessing to didn't really make sense. And instead of the police in that moment saying, what do you mean? Like, you know, making it make sense or pressing in the right places to get a strong narrative or see if there's any other truth that isn't what you're saying now. 
I think they were so green. They were so excited that somebody was, right? You know that they had caught the bad guy. They wanted to get. They got a conviction. That they blew it. Mm. So what did he say? Well, how involved did he claim he was? He just said he burned the body. That's it. He didn't kill her. The story is still so weird and convoluted, but it goes a little something like this. And what was where the motive too? The motive is also extremely unclear. He says that he woke up in the middle of the night, drunk out of his mind, got in this truck and drove about 15, 20 minutes straight to Tara's house for whatever reason to rob her. And he breaks into her house with a credit card and she, I guess, appears from the darkness or something and he got spooked and he hit her one hit, one punch, and she's dead. And I'm like, what? That doesn't make sense. Maybe that is how it happened, but that makes no fucking sense, right? No. And, and they just took that just word for word like it was no big deal, as if, you know, no one else in the town or any juror wouldn't think that was a little odd, right? Mm. So he claims he went to her house, broke in, punched her in the face, she died, and then he dragged her out and decided to keep burn her so body. So then he goes back to his friend's house, and the next day he tells him when he w wakes up that last night he killed Tara Grenstead. And I think, according to their narrative, he first didn't believe him, and then he went and he goes and shows uh, the body to Ryan or to Bo, to Bo. Mm. and he's like, "Holy shit, you did kill our ex, our, our former teacher." And you know, I think the the biggest thing about this to me was that it sounded like maybe Ryan didn't really remember what happened actually. Even if he did kill her, he, I don't think that he really remembered it. And so, like, the the ongoing building narrative that was just, you know, that I was not forcing, that was just coming to me and is ends up being a stronger version of events, is that what if this other guy told him he did this? Who, Bo? Bo Duke says, you killed Tara Grinstead last night. Mm-hmm. And if you look at both of them, you look at their behavior, one's a liar, one's abusive, one's nasty, one has, you know, had trouble with the law his whole life, is a proven liar, is a, you know, for fraud, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Other guy, no one even really knows, is the quiet guy. The quiet guy is who, Bo? Ryan. Ryan. And so if you just look at them on paper, you're like, it's really this guy? And, and maybe it is. But when these things start adding up and there isn't a a strong narrative as to why Tara was killed by Ryan and how he did it, then it makes you wonder, well, why don't I know those things? Because mm. that should be there, I think. And they failed to do that, and that's why, in my opinion, he was found not guilty. What is your tinfoil hat theory on why this could have happened? Not saying that you're saying that's what it is. Yeah, but. I mean, I think that there's no way that Bo Dukes is not more involved than he's said in the past. I don't know to what degree that is, but until that narrative makes sense to me, I'm going to have some big glaring questions and there's going to be some big red flags there. And I think it all goes back to him. And so I don't know exactly how it all happened. I don't know if, you know, they drove over to her house or if he did that or if they met in some other place entirely. But there's no way it happened the way they said it did. There's no way Ryan wakes up and goes, oh, I'm going to Tara's house. Do you have any theories of what the motive could be? I think maybe they, they could have been hanging out and, you know, maybe on some friendship type stuff, just like with Tara. Yeah. Uh, and something got out of control. Something got out of hand and, you know she ended up dead somehow and that would involve you know somebody likely doing something sexual or went to that place and i think that if you look at the behavior of someone like bo dukes you know <laughs> he does that kind of stuff you know he's raped somebody before he's oh, really he's in jail for rape right now so it's not like it's out of his character and so you know i don't want to you know point the finger at anybody but you know, there's a big question mark there, and I think that if we knew some of the, you know, the main pieces, like, how did they ever link up? 
To me, that was the big one. If we knew that, then I think that it, we, you could piece the rest together. But it didn't happen from some guy waking up drunk out of his mind right. and just saying, no, like I'm going to go to my former teacher's house to steal what? She's a teacher. She doesn't make any money. That sounds like absolute bullshit. Yeah. And it's so surprising that the prosecutors and the, and the investigators would just be just be able to settle with that explanation. It blew my mind that like in the five years. But it is Georgia. It, it is Georgia. <laughs> I mean, they had five years to get their story straight, and they ran with the same bullshit they did five wow. years ago, and they're mad at me about it. <laughs> it's like, okay. Who's mad at you? Um, it, some people in the GBI have never really, you know, liked me very much, and I get it. I, I'm probably, you know, a thorn in their side a little bit. Of course. Some guy coming down and, you know, poking at this case, and... Anything that I find doesn't make you look good because why didn't you find it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's their, you know, responsibility to actually solve it. And so I think they just really didn't like the fact that I had, that I was investigating this case and I made this podcast that got so hugely popular and put them under the microscope. Right. How many, uh, how many people have listened to this whole series so far? It's, um... I, I want to say it's over 400 million, over 400 uh, million downloads across the series. and That's incredible, man. It's been huge. Um, and I think it's just really a testament to um, like the kind of the style we, we go approach a, a story like this. And it feeling like something is happening. This is special. We're trying to actually solve the murder we're not just retelling, rehashing some tragedy, mm. right? And I think there's a big difference. Right, right. There's something to looking under rock, picking up rocks that haven't been picked up before and looking underneath them and finding something that has never had li light shined on it before and then just going down, that, falling down that rabbit hole forever. Or until picking up the, the same rock and being like, hey, like I know you all picked this up a long time ago, but... Right. Did y'all look very well? <laughs> right. But I mean, specifically when it comes to like creating entertainment or media or something mm -hmm. like that and, and publishing it, like when you look at the media landscape, it's all stuff that just gets recycled and regurgitated and people just want to like follow what's already popular or what's going to get them more listens or views or whatever. But when you actually like take risks and, and look for shit that no one's talking about, that is the stuff I think that ha is extremely powerful. And that was what was new for me that was the biggest learning curve was, you know, what the hell am I doing as a investigator, podcaster, trying to solve this cold case? How do I juggle this? I knew how to do the creative part to an extent, because that's what I've been doing my right. whole life. And right. I was just, you know, learning from my mistakes and just kept building on what I felt was working. But, you know, me being this sort of, you know, outlier in this small town, talking to strangers and gaining people's trust that was a a new thing in in that sort of way and that was arguably the hardest part about doing up and vanished was dealing with the realness and the heaviness of everything and knowing how big of a responsibility it really was at the time yeah it's like you're just like putting this puzzle together, like mm -hmm. playing a game and these people's lives are actually like at stake. Yeah. As a listener, yeah, it's a podcast, right? But, yeah. you know, these people are still going to call me, <laughs> you know, mm. they're real people. They're living a real life. And so am I. It might be a cool listen, but it doesn't end when you press stop for me. What kind of how many people were reaching out to you? Did you get anybody that like emailed you or contacted you about this case that like provided any big breaks or even lead you on to more stories? There was tons. I mean, there it's like endless. It was pretty much all the, the big things that were revelations in the show were things that people had reached out to me about that I sort of verified myself on my own. One of them being that the cops did go and uh, search that pecan orchard based on that tip back in 2005. Oh, wow. And, you know, that was a huge piece of information uh, because it also kind of brought up the idea that are the statute of limitations up on this? Because if they were looking into this in 05, you know, if it's been past 10 years in some scenario, there's a possibility that they couldn't be charged with something. 
because they they blew it. Also, you blew it, right? right? Did they ever find her DNA or any, any sort of... So they've always been like real elusive about what they did find. And what I've been told and I believe is the truth is that they found bone uh, fragments, uh, I think specifically uh, teeth, that they were able to test. Um, you know, they burned her body for days and there wasn't much left. Also, it had been over a decade out there. Days so, they burned for out. days, and so there and really wasn't a saw lot. That there was no witnesses or anything to this. I mean, they're just out there in the boonies, way out on this private pecan orchard. I think people knew that that there was uh, something burning, but I don't think anyone thought it was that right. And so they had a huge property that this could be done on and mm. sort of get away with it, which I mean they did. So, and the building that burned down that was just a false flag that had just, nothing to do with it. Yep, just false flag, just a weird thing. Weird coincidence, just like many others in the case, and it's all a result of you know not looking down the right direction from the very beginning and looking everywhere else, and then trying to make that work. Mm-hmm. And that's what the that's what the police were doing. Wow, man. So, what are you working on next? What did you decide to do after that? Like more true crime investigations like this? Try to dig into more unsolved mysteries? Yeah. So uh, after. Season one, I I made another true crime podcast called Atlanta Monster about the Atlanta child murders in the 80s. And it was a limited series, 10 episodes, and it was a investigative thing again, but also sort of a history lesson in terms of, you know, you know the, what was happening back then in the 80s and, you know, culture at the time and racism and all those things. And I eventually got Wayne Williams on the phone. And so the last half of the show is me talking to him and him basically trying to convince me why he isn't the Atlanta child murderer. Who is Wayne? Oh, he, he, so he's the guy who was arrested for the okay. Atlanta child murders. And he's definitely the guy who killed those kids. Um, but he would tell you otherwise. And there are some things that are weird that don't add up. But the guy is a pathological liar. He's a psychopath. And I talked to him at length for months. In person or on the phone? On the phone. And I was able to eventually get to the point where I was going back through all the tape I had and could trip him up on his lies and sort of, uh, you know, hopefully put to rest, at least for me, that this guy is a liar. You know, just because this looks weird over here doesn't mean that he didn't kill these 15 kids over here. So what is the story? What what is this guy's story? If you could like sum it up, like give me like a elevator yeah. pitch of what this guy's all about. Well, what the, and like the case of the whole Atlanta child murders. So in the early '80s in Atlanta, uh, black children were going missing and turning up dead, and it got to the point where they realized that something was happening. These weren't these were all connected in some way, and there was likely a serial killer. And this is kind of and the visors being left out in the public. Yes, and yes, and they were all kids. They were all black, and going missing from, you know, uh, the poor neighborhoods. And eventually, they find their suspect, and his name is Wayne Williams, and he was a black guy, and he worked in the music industry. Uh, that's a loose description. <laughs> um, but he recruited kids and it was like kind of trying to make his own band, right? Like a Jackson five kind of thing. And so he had access to these kids and they eventually, the, 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 the smoking gun for Wayne was when they went and searched his house, they found these carpet fibers that matched several of the bodies of the victims. And normally you'd say, okay, a a carpet fiber, right? Like everyone has carpet. Why is that not someone else's house? Well, it just so happened that this particular fiber that they tracked down all the way was so incredibly rare that it was in like maybe one or two other houses in the state. And so the likelihood of these fibers being on these victims collectively on its own is crazy. But for 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 those fibers to also be in Wayne Williams' house, what are the odds? And so that was really kind of how they were able to close the book on uh, Wayne Williams being the Atlanta child murderer. He only went to jail for two of the murders, but a lot more are are attributed to him. How many? Uh, I mean, some say as many as 30, but I think it's probably realistically um, 15, 17 of the kids that he he killed. Um, I think that 
some of the other um, kids on the list, I think that there were other circumstances that um, that were weird, but don't really match the motive and the MO of the other murders. And I think those are just outliers, and there's probably a, a bunch of different reasons for that. Um, and so it, he kind of likes to look at those cases that he, maybe he didn't actually commit and say, see, I didn't do that. And it's like, yeah, you probably didn't, but you killed all of these other kids. And so it's a really bizarre thing. And I just got so tired of talking to this guy. It was exhausting. And yeah. eventually I had to block his number from, from jail, from all my phones after I kind of you know let him hang himself. What was his background? What, why, how did he get involved in this? And had he been in and out of jail before? Was he, what was his motive to doing this? That's always been a big question mark. And I think that what the general consensus is, and it's never really been proven, but it seems like there was probably some sexual nature to the crimes. Um, I think that, you know, there was probably some sort of pedophilia type, you know, either motivation or something where he was attracted to these kids. And that's also why he did the music stuff like that. And mm. he just started scooping them up and maybe he did something one time and got away with it. And I think he liked the fact that he was able to get away with something so t terrible. And he was kind of one of those guys who was a whiz at the time in terms of like radio technology and almost like a, a you know, chasing the news. And he even sort of liked to go out to crime scenes himself and as like a independent reporter. And so he, I think he got off on the fact that he was killing these kids and they were all trying to figure out who it was and he was still doing it and getting away with it. You know, it's hard to, there's was no there good any... reason for him to kill a kid, but I think that that's probably in his head what he got from it. Was there any sort of like racial motive involved? And you say he was black and he was only killing black kids. Did he ever, what did he say about that? And that's, that's the weird thing, right? It's like, you know, I think that that shocked a lot of people that it was a, a, a black guy who, who killed these black kids and i bet no one expected that and but even the police themselves and they had said early on like the fbi profilers they were saying you know what i don't think that a white guy could have done it actually because if a white guy was going in and snatching kids from these neighborhoods that would be noticed immediately right and so they had a hunch that whoever this person was whatever their color was he was able to blend in with his environment and go completely unnoticed while committing these crimes. And so that was kind of a leading a factor in terms of the profile they were building of the suspect. And yeah, that, and to a lot of people, it's still very shocking. I don't know if it was a race thing. I, I think he was just taking advantage of the kids who were closest to him when this was going on was there sort of a media frenzy around some sort of like oh yeah ra racial narrative around it it was huge i mean it was also in the 80s when you know racism is uh, alive and well at that point right and you know it was at a time where it was you know super charged and these black kids were going missing and it seemed like no one was doing anything about it and then it eventually became a national news story for some of those same reasons. And it was really the, you know, the Georgia police, the GBI, the Atlanta police, they wanted this thing to go away. It was not making Georgia or Atlanta look very good. Mm. They're like, we need to figure out who the hell this guy is and put him behind bars. And so they really pulled out all the stops and they eventually did catch this guy. But at the time it was a, a huge story that had a lot of implications and it was a, a big shock when Wayne Williams turned out to be the killer. Did he confess to any of that or does he still maintain his innocence? Fully? He still maintains his innocence, which also people do that. There's plenty of people who we know 
I mean, O.J. Simpson says he didn't do it either. Right. Also, I think he says sometimes he did, he did do it. But yeah, it's mm-hmm. uh, I, I, it's not surprising. This uh, if you analyze him, and I'm I'm not even like a you know expert at that, but <laughs> if you even just for the layperson, he's a he's a pathological liar, and he's good at li- good at lying. He's actually pretty charming when you talk to him on the phone, and you're like, ah, oh, stop! He he gets you like going down this way when you were trying to go that way, and he's just really good at it. And I think he's probably convinced himself, and he believes that he didn't do it either. He's convinced himself at this point. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get a lot of. I, I'm from what you're saying. I get a lot of Charles Manson vibes from this guy. Does he seem? Did he seem at all kind of just like completely lost his mind, full of himself, narcissistic? He's narcissistic for sure. He's definitely full of himself. Um, he's super charming and uh, quick and sort of witty and kind of unassuming. Like you wouldn't think that this frail old man who's acting all jolly could have done this. Right. But if you start just peeling it all back and looking at the facts, it supports the fact that he did. And there are some things that he's lied about that he shouldn't have. Mm. And it's just, you know, you get into a pattern of covering your ass. At what point are you lying about everything? Have you ever read um, Tom O'Neill's book Chaos? No. About Charles Manson. Is it good? It's really good. He spent. Uh, he was a reporter for some sort of Hollywood magazine, and he was tasked to just write a quick report on the 10 year anniversary, or it was the 20 year anniversary, I think, of the Manson murders. And uh, he did it, and then he just he started looking into it and asking for some interviews. Next thing you know, he spent 20 years going down this rabbit hole and three lawsuits with the different magazines that paid him to report on it because he was just so invested in it. And he ended up finding all these gaping holes in the story from everything from um, Jolly West, who was a CIA chemist, to uh, his probation officer, who was like working with this uh, free clinic in San Francisco with a bunch of hippies and like doing these crazy tests with LSD and with amphetamines. And, um, you know, there's a, like these just gaping holes in that, in that story. And, um, he never got to the bottom of it, but it's a fascinating book, how he covers it. Um, and I'm getting a lot of the same vibes from what you're saying about this guy. So I'm curious, like, did this guy ever go to prison before all this stuff? Like how much connection did he have to, the law enforcement or the FBI or anything like that because there's just so many weird psyops in history when it comes mm-hmm. to like murder cases like this that get tons of media coverage especially when there's a lot I'm not saying that that, that this is what it is but mm-hmm. it's it smells fishy like that there, and that's kind of one of the problems with the case is that if you look at it on a surface level you can you know draw those assumptions yeah. it, it, it's very easy to fall down the slippery conspiracy theory slope with this case especially because there's just weird stuff in it it's just there's Mm -hmm. oddities that exist but the thing is sometimes weird shit happens yeah and uh, you know at a certain point you have to look at the cold hard evidence and to put your blinders on and objectively say hey these things couldn't have happened unless he did it right i don't care how weird it is right so he definitely did it. He definitely did it. And you said there was 30 kids? There was, uh, yeah, 30 kids on the list. And um, I think that he probably killed h- half the kids on that list. And who who would have killed the rest of them? Was it someone he was involved with? or was? I don't think that copycats? it was a serial killer. Um, I think that they were all just completely different circumstances. Um, and if you dive into the cases, you, you can tell that it was likely, you know, some may have, may have been just a, a, a one-off thing that, you know, some other person killed this kid or there was family stuff involved over here Mm -hmm. and just different kind of scenarios and settings and MOs for every other case that it was kind of like it not connected to anything other than they just happened at the same time. And because they're all lumped together into this, this list, um, he just likes to hang on the fact that he didn't kill every one of those kids. Does he have, did, is he a death penalty or does he have like life in prison or life in this? prison life no death no death does georgia still have the death penalty i think so if you have life in prison why wouldn't you just admit if you really did it you're already in jail for life i think because he still gets off on people like me who you know wanted to hear him out 
it's like I'm sure he's moved on to the next one. You know, you know there's they've done so many documentaries on this mm. over time, over the decades that I think that to him it's like the bane of his existence at this point. He likes to be able to preach this narrative to other people. It's like he's still spinning the same bullshit web that he was spinning before he went to jail. And that's just he he'll never stop doing that. It's strange, man. It is are, very are, strange. Are all your stories based out of Georgia? Like do all of them come out of Atlanta, your area, or Georgia in specific? Uh no, th- those were the two biggest cases that okay. I covered. Um but yeah, I, season 2 of Up and Vanish was a missing person from Crestone, Colorado, this small town. Uh, her name's Crystal Risinger, and then season 3 was about Ashley Loring, heavy runner. Uh, missing from a Native American reservation mm. um, in Montana. And so really like all the cases that I've covered and the true crime stories I've made podcasts about have taken me kind of all over the place at this point. Did you but, have to move to these places when you start reporting on them? Um, for a period of time, yeah. I mean, uh, I will you know get like a part-time apartment or Airbnb for you know a long extended period of time and yeah. really kind of be there and immerse myself in the story and actually for season three we rented an RV and we oh sick we just went to you know around the town and people we wanted to interview we would just invite them onto the RV and had a whole basic basically like a studio set up because it was really kind of uncomfortable in a lot of situations to impose going into their house and there was no real good public place to do this and so we kind of needed to bring our you know controlled element to them interesting to get that tape and to have these one-on-ones with people what was that recent case in florida that happened i think it was uh was that gabby petito the girl who was in that reservation i forget i forget how that story went. i did a whole podcast on it but she that was like maybe a year ago and they found, I think they found her. Did you follow that at all? Um, you're talking about the, where they were out west on... Yeah, they were out west in some nature reserve. And she, they got actually got, her boyfriend got pulled over. Yes. They were driving a truck. Yes. And they interviewed her and she seemed like psychotic. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, you couldn't miss that case. That was right. all over. Everywhere. Yeah, it was like uh, insanely covered. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was a, a bizarre case. Did they ever find that guy? Yeah, I think he, he killed himself. Um, oh, did he? I think they, yeah, they found him and a gun somewhere nearish to where he was last. In Everglades or something. Yeah. Um, and there was some sort of, I think, suicide note. I don't know if they ever released what it said. Maybe they did, but it was you know clear that he had just ran off and ended his life. Yeah. What is it about like national parks and people disappearing? I think that there's probably just so many places, uh, so many ways you, it could go wrong. You know, you might fall down this crevice, you might get eaten by a bear. Yeah. You might just break your leg and, you know, you're screaming for help and no one hears you and you die of starvation and it's the, perfect place the to bear is going to make sure there's no remains of you left, unfortunately. And so they might never find you. Or right. there are aliens abducting you, I don't know. Or it's the perfect place to kill somebody. You could just feed them to a bear or feed them to a... Oh yeah, it's like, there's, there. it's so remote. It's, uh, yeah, you gotta be careful out there, especially if you're walking around by yourself. Yeah, man, that's freaking crazy. So a, a lot of these stories that you're reporting on, you're getting tips from people that are like reaching out to you being like, hey, you gotta look at this. Yeah, pretty much every case I've covered at a certain point in the podcast, I'm getting this surge of new information mm-hmm. as a result of what they're listening to. And so because the townspeople know this podcast exists, and they're hearing stuff, they're raising their hand and offering mm-hmm. the information that they have. And, you know, I didn't know they exist, didn't know they existed until then. And so it's right. kind of a, a living, breathing thing in that way where it yeah. kind of builds on itself. Yeah, it's weird how when you do something like this, I'm sure this happened with your Up and Vanish the first season in Georgia. I'm sh- like the whole town just becomes completely engulfed in the story where it's all anyone talks about. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it was because the biggest thing ever everybody. there. And it, you know, what I realized had happened before the break in the case, it was from all the townspeople, it seemed like it was, you know, 99% of them 
loved what I was doing. I, I was, you know, in their eyes, like this good Samaritan mm -hmm. who was, you know, going out of his way, putting himself at risk to tell this story and, you know, uncover the truth. And then once the break in the case happened and, you know, the podcast was so big and polarizing, I think that the people in the town who were genuinely hurt by what was going on, they either had to say, you know, they wanted to point their finger at somebody and it was either me or the police. Why would they point their finger at you? I, you know, it's a good question. I, I think that, and I think because it's easy to assign, you know, blame to something, you know, if I, had I not been here doing this and maybe this, you know, you wouldn't have been disrupted the way that you were. And if you really break that down, it's kind of sounds crazy, but I think that people need to assign that to someone. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I realized that, yes, yeah, some people are, are going to be upset that I, I've done this and, or that I'm doing this just because I'm disrupting their lives and not personally or individually, but because it's such a big thing that's happening in such a small place. They well, what can't is, escape it. Well, what does their the family think about it? What is, what is their... Are you communicating with them still? What, what do they say about what you did? I don't really talk to her family that much anymore. Um, you know, I've talked to tons of her friends I, and and family. I know it, it's it's a big family and there's a she knew a bunch of people. And so, you know, even that's always been a little bit divided, right? Really? Yeah. I, I think that it, people want to point the finger somewhere and it, the, the the problem with doing true crime stuff or an unsolved murder case is that when you find the truth it's going to hurt it's really ugly what happened it was mm -hmm. it's really terrible stuff yeah peeling off the it's scalp, not never it's nice. not a good thing right it's yeah. not no one's having fun it's mm -hmm. the worst of the worst mm -hmm. and it, that's really hard to deal with I've never had to deal with something like that on a personal level, but I've seen it firsthand up close to people that I grew close with and cared about. And so I know that it's something that is completely tragic and life altering. Mm -hmm. And so I think when something that tragic happens to anybody, it can shape your perception of the things around you and you know, I don't take any of it personally that if someone didn't like me or they think that when a X, Y, Z, that's okay. I, I, I understand, but I, I'm not going to, you're just exploiting my daughter's death. I mean, someone might say that, you know, and it's, I know I, I can go to sleep every night just fine knowing that that's not true mm. because having done it and like lived through the podcast investigation of it all and from every step of the way i knew how hard that was and how immense that responsibility was and that i gave it my all to make sure that i did it the most respectful way possible and never ever lose sight of the what matters the most which was trying to figure out what happened to Tara Grinstead. And that I led with that and I continued with that forever. Do you think that your podcast had anything to do with that guy coming forward and ratting out Ryan? Yeah, so some people, especially on Reddit, it seems, really have a distaste for me. Um, they say stuff like, you know, Payne claims he solved that murder. He didn't solve anything. And, you know, my first response is, well, one, I never claimed to have solved anything. Well, no, you, right? ripped, you ripped the scab off. Right. And I think people just misinterpret certain things this way. Like, oh, he played a, a, a call from his grandmother who said this. I'm like, you would play a call from your grandmother too, man. It's not that deep. Mm -hmm. It was a special thing at the time. It was, I was, it was really happening. And so... I would never say that I solved that case because that wouldn't be true. But I know for sure that the podcast prompted Bo Dukes to start talking again. Right. And I know that 
I have proof of that because I have text messages from him sending the podcast to other people before really yes before he ever confessed to anything how do you have those text messages because they sent them to me from multiple te- multiple people law enforcement sent them to you oh hell no um other friends who i guess narked them out but no um shit yeah so I, I have like the and i don't to me it's like i don't need that validation either way i know that like it clearly brought new life into a case that needed it at the time mm-hmm. and i think good things happen from that um but i you know it's it's true that he, this was on his radar and i think that he probably in his narcissistic way felt kind of cool about it and he just couldn't keep his mouth shut i don't think it was so much of him being scared i think that it was everyone in the town talking about this and then the whole nation kind of on fire with this podcast and he knew the truth, I think that was empowering to him. And that's yeah. when he slipped up and started spilling the beans a little bit. I thought it was interesting how he mentioned, I was watching a video of his testimony and uh, I forget if it was, I forget who was on the stand. I think it was the brother of mm-hmm. Ryan Duke. Yeah. And he was basically saying he was at a party with Bo and Bo was like, hey man, I know who killed her. It was your brother. And he's like, really? He's like, no, 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 just kidding. Don't say anything. That was very interesting how he... These weird exchanges like that, you're like, what? Like... Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to wrap your mind around these conversations. And also, like, you would see why someone like that wouldn't believe them. Can you pull up the video of um, Ryan Ryan Duke's testimony on the case? He seemed very, very odd when he was on the witness stand. He was like... He is odd. <laughs> like, just objectively weird. He seemed out of all of them to be the weirdest. With, yeah, it doesn't matter. Just pull up any part of Ryan. Like if you skip forward and they, if you look at the way he answers the questions, how he like moves his throat to the microphone every time he says something. It was pretty shocking that they even brought him up on the stand. Really, that was kind of a surprise to most people. Why wouldn't? They, yeah, this. Yes, right here. Yeah, full screen. Who were those roommates? Uh, Hank McMahon, Bo Dukes. And did you guys party a lot? Has he got a lipper in right now? Yes, sir. It, it looks like he's got a big old hog. Yeah. Both were either in school. Uh, no, Hank was in school, and that's all Bo did. That guy looks guilty as shit. Uh, did anyone <laughs> do any drugs? Yes, sir. Uh, what drugs did folks do? Uh, marijuana and cocaine. <laughs> and Just a little. When you were, your job at Stewart Finance, was that a full-time or part-time job? It was full-time. How long did you work at Stewart Finance? When, when did you finish? That's Stewart? a country boy right uh, there. The next summer. So this would have been about summer 2004. So you, did you ever talk to him? And um, I never talked to him directly, but I talked to him through um, one of his good friends and as kind of like a conduit um, when he was in prison. They, I mean, he was instructed to not talk to me at all. It, and that makes sense, right? Because mm. I'm going to try to ask the hard questions and figure out what's going on here. Um but, uh, you know, I, I, there's been transmissions between a friend and, you know, he's he's a weird mystery. But, you know, I've, I've never said that Ryan Duke, you know, couldn't have done this. You know, I, I've that I've never thought that he had nothing to do with this. Mm. I just think that there's a missing piece to the puzzle. And, it's, and until that narrative of what happened to Tara, how they got together makes even the slightest bit of sense then if you have this big elephant in the room with Bo Dukes, who's clearly a piece of shit person, who's capable of doing messed up stuff, I, I'm not going to feel good about saying that it happened the way that they said. Do you think it could have been like murder for hire? Do you think it could have been the Iraqi no. veteran boyfriend? No. Convinced those guys to kill her? No. I think, I think that was just, just too deep. It's like... Yeah, but it seems the most obvious because it seems like the only motive. The thing is, is that he didn't... He had no reason to want her dead. It's like he, yeah, he it, broke up with her and it's like if his heart was broken, you could start, you know, spinning the conspiracy theory that, you know, he had, was going to take her out or something. But it's... There was no real motive there. It was peculiar that he was in town during that time period that she went missing, but 
So was everybody else, Didn't really. Didn't she break up with him first, though, and then he broke up with her after? Or yes. He, so he claims? Yes. And that's all, That's all like, he said, she said relationship drama. It is. If you're overseas fighting across the fucking world and your girlfriend's yeah. in the same little town, like, jumping around from guy to guy, sleeping with students, you would be fucking distraught. Yeah, I think that it was really, Marcus Harper had moved on in his head. He still cared about her, but yeah. he... he didn't want to be in that kind of relationship with her anymore, just like anyone else would, wouldn't want to be in their own circumstances. So there was nothing really mm. suspicious to me about that. You know, the only thing that was like odd really was that he was in town, you know, doing the police right along that night. Um, but his alibi held up, right? Yeah. And, and, and that, that happened, but, um, you know, what's, even crazier really is that he was doing that and she still got murdered under everyone's nose like mm -hmm. the town is not very big right it's just like the timing and the there's just like the exact moment it had to all happen it's just so really weird and just like it's amazing how confusing it had the whole story is and how many people are involved and how hard it was to figure this out in such a small little town where everybody knows each other yeah it's it's like i've spent more time than i'd like to admit trying to put these pieces together and i can never get them all the way there and I, i've just kind of come to terms with the fact that you know we'll never know the full story and even yeah. if Bo comes back with a new story or Ryan does, do we even believe them at this point? No. Right. And so I think we'll never know unless there's some other big revelation that I don't even know where that would come from. Mm. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's wild. It's, and it's, I feel like it's rare, too, where these outlandish mystery murder stories don't have some extreme element of corruption of either from law enforcement or some other angle with authorities mm -hmm. covering shit up and shit like that. So I yeah. think it's wild that this thing, this story has none of that. It just, it just has incompetence. There, yeah, there's, there's a difference between you know, there's, yeah, there's corruption and there's incompetence. Yeah, this is a, this is incompetence, mm -hmm. um, and I think that you could assign that to a, a bunch of different people, and collectively that created a nightmare scenario of going down the wrong rabbit holes for a decade um, that could have been prevented. Mm. Did Bo and Ryan get, they got life in prison, both of them? So uh, Ryan, it, he got found not guilty. So he's free. He is getting free. He's still serving, going to serve some time for uh, what he took place in that he admitted to, which was destroying the evidence, burning Tara's body with Bo. And uh, Bo was arrested a couple of years ago he went on this you know psycho tear and had you know abducted these girls and held them at gunpoint what? and raped them just out of seemingly nowhere and so he's currently serving time for that right now he'll probably be in jail forever Did eventually he get any time for this i don't think that they've they've done that yet like wow they've been able to postpone that and they're gonna they're gonna hit him with you know the most they can hit him with, but right now I, I think he's serving at least twenty, um, in in prison, and he'll never see the light of day because they're gonna hit him with everything else, and mm. maybe it's another twenty. If he comes out ever, he'll be an old man with no friends and no life and no money. What does Tara's parents or family say about those guys? What are the, do they believe that he they're the ones who did it? They definitely believe that they're involved i think that they believe that ryan duke did it they believe that ryan did it not yes Bo. and I, I think that they you know they believe the um the gbi's narrative and they want someone to go down for their daughter's murder i completely sympathize with that and so if they believe that ryan duke is the murderer obviously they'd be very upset that he was found not guilty for it but I think that's more of a testament of how law enforcement treated this case and how they wasted five years not yeah. making their case any stronger. I don't think the blame can go anywhere else there.
What else are you doing? What other kind of stuff are you doing besides this? Are you working on how many podcasts are you working on right now? Man, we had so many. Um, so I mean, I've done tons of true crime stuff. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was I had this crazy idea of of making an investigative show about UFOs, UAP, and you know, as a kid, I always just kind of liked the idea. Just sci-fi stuff in general always, you know, intrigued me. Steven Spielberg movies, you name it, and so it really kind of started as just a passion project, an idea that I was fond of, even just the idea of, you know, what else, you know, what if there's something else out there and we're not alone. And so I kind of went down this road of trying to, you know, put together an investigative story that was in the same vein as the other true crime stories I've told about cold cases and take a similar approach to the topic of UFOs in in modern history and today and really kind of figure out you know what's really up like what's going on and I found out pretty quickly uh, you know through my journey that there was a lot more meat to this bone than I had really even imagined because I'd never really gone down the rabbit holes to explore it in this analytical kind of way and I became, you know, completely convinced beyond a doubt that there is something otherworldly going on and it's just happening right there in front of us under our noses and no one cares. And I, my goal with my new podcast called High Strange was to make a podcast for the skeptic for the non-believer or for someone who's on the fence or someone like me who was like, yeah, they're probably real, but like, I don't know. And, and not, you know, forcefully feed something to someone who might have an aversion right away if it, if it pokes their belief system a little bit. Mm. And so I wanted to kind of take a different approach, lay person's approach in unpacking some of the most compelling and hard to the hardest to debunk cases in our history and kind of lay it all out there for you to decide just like I would a true crime podcast and I it, with the goal being that I want you to listen and I understand why people would be resistant to this idea because it it there's a lot of implications that come with it if you believe that we're not alone you know, if you're if you believe the Bible or you believe this or that, it might be hard to make all these things fit for yourself. And because of that, some people just don't want to go there at all. Hmm. And so I was trying to make something where I was, hey, wait, before you tune out, like, let me just let me just share something with you. And I'm not going to, you know, forcefully, you know, put this on you. I'm going to spoon feed it to you and maybe if we can finish this thing together, we can have a real healthy conversation about this topic. So I think that's what it needs is a objective, healthy, normal conversation across the board with the reality that is. Interesting. So how do you take the approach with that documentary? How do you start it? My first, the first thing I, I wanted to do was go find some of the most compelling stories in modern history that have that are still technically unsolved or haven't been debunked right and interview the people who experienced it and so i i interviewed travis walton in episode one and two and you know his story is he went missing for five days in in the woods with this logging crew came back with this crazy story of being on a spaceship and I met with him in person with my producer Mike and you know by the end of the conversation we both looked at each other and said I'm like do you believe him and he's like yeah I'm like me too and so I was able to walk away with my personal assessment of even if he was lying I can tell you for sure that Travis Walton himself believes it and there really is no definitive way to disprove it. And even if, to me, if it was somehow not what they said it was, the circumstances are so bizarre that the alternative of what could have happened 
is almost stranger than what they're saying happened. And to me, that's compelling. And you can present that kind of case to someone who would be a skeptic and, okay, you poke your holes in this then. You tell me how you feel when you hear this guy talk. You tell me what you think about this. And I think there's a few cases kind of like that in history where there's a lot of strong components to it. And it's really hard to poke that hole that you'd want to poke if you were some stark non-believer of something. Yeah. The odd thing about that phenomenon is that if these things are some sort of civilization from somewhere else that are visiting us, they are deliberately only making themselves visible enough to convince someone willing to believe, but not enough to convince the the skeptic. They're not providing enough evidence to convince somebody who's not willing to believe. They're right on that line. Mm Mm-hmm. And why is that? And I don't know if I believed. I don't, I don't, the thing about people like Travis is he definitely believes his own story. Of course. But does that mean that really happened? The, what, does what, not mean that, no. We don't have evidence that it did happen. We don't have evidence that it didn't happen. Other than the fact Correct. That, that he's told the same story and apparently he has a couple other kids that, that were there that verify everything that happened. Yes. According to his story. But, um, you know, there's definitely a psychological component to that where at a point it becomes religious. Yeah. I mean, it does. <laughs> and it, once you once you come out with that story and it, it gets that much attention, why change it? Yeah, I think that there's definitely an argument to be made that, you know, he, he's making this up for whatever reason and shit that might even be true i don't i don't know um but i personally think that if if there's any part of his story that's like completely untrue it's everything that happened after they saw this flying saucer in the woods i think these guys weren't close enough friends with each other in real life to go to their graves with this you know cons- this packed of lies of them having seen something weird in the woods right and where was travis for all those days if his family was genuinely looking for him then he wasn't with them or was his brother in on it and to what end it's like that part's hard for me to rationalize like he would have had to have seized the moment and been like i'm gonna go run off and hide for five days and come back with a crazy story. Maybe he did that, but that's, that to me is crazy too. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, where were you? You know, cause they were looking for him. It's like, it was like a manhunt. What year was that? 1975. That's another weird thing to me is how come this stuff has stopped happening? I don't there's think that Betty it stopped Hill, happening. There's him, there's Ruiz and Bobwe, there's all these these close encounters of the, what is that, the third kind? How come we, ha- we don't hear about this anymore? I don't think that we don't hear about it anymore. I think that if you look at the past 50 years, you can say, okay, yeah, there's that case, there's that case, and they've become sort of like the legendary staple cases you know, that are synonymous with this topic. But I don't think that you know, it's ever really stopped. I also don't think it's a I common heard any thing. Reports of that. Uh, reports of what? Close encounters of the third kind, similar to Travis Walton or Ruiz and Zimbabwe or Betty and Barney Hill. I haven't heard any new cases like that since those cases, since the '90s, early '90s. But if you even look at that for what it is, it's like, okay, how far are we zooming out? I don't think that something like the Roswell incident or the Travis Walton incident is something that happens a lot. <laughs> if, the, if they were really happening, if those are true, I don't think it's a common thing. There also could be, like, well, you can speculate a lot, a lot about it. 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Hasn't, I don't, do you know of any cases after the 90s? After the 90s? Yeah. I the mean, the century. Phoenix Lights and, you know, 2000s, there was, you know, a, a mass sighting. Right, but I'm talking about, like, abductions, like, a, like abduction encounters. I mean, there's or, people who... It, fucking every year claim they've been abducted but the problem with that is right. that how do you prove that right and you know with with the Betty Barney Hill case what's unique about it is because because it's so old it's like kind of like almost like an origin story for the abduction phenomenon mm. and so like when I look at that it, there's not very many like uh, I guess things they could pull this stuff from 
it's they had to either like the idea of a craft floating there making no noise being abducted experiencing loss of time how many other places was that before the betty barney hill case not many not that i'm thinking of off the top of my head Mm. in you know the 1960s and so did every other case follow suit with that kind of narrative and was influenced by that or did they really genuinely experience something that you know not many people had on record at least experienced yet and so there's there's cases where people claim that they've been abducted as recently as yesterday probably but you know did they really get abducted uh, probably not was it sleep paralysis maybe but there's no way to verify their stories really anyway like what would it take for you to believe them anyways I mean, would it be the 4K video on your iPhone of the spaceship? I mean, that might do it, but then would you then would you say uh, that's fake because it looks too real? Mm. Maybe I'm like I always kind of joke around with with Mike. Like, it, I I feel like you know what is proof, right? Like, what would be enough for anybody? Let's just say today, like right when I left, that's the problem. There is you know on Fox, on CNN, on across the board, on all news networks. There is a spacecraft landing on the White House lawn, and these aliens are stepping out and shaking Biden's hand. Well, one, I'd be like, that's suspicious, right? But, like, I still think what would happen is people would say, that's a conspiracy. Then that's not true, or this is... And, like, it doesn't matter what it is. Like, you're going to believe what you want to believe. I just think the, you know, I don't know how far the abduction stuff goes. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like to what end the truth, you know, where it ends, I guess. Mm. Well, you're starting your series with Travis Walton. And that was kind of a bold decision. You're not really, uh, you're not really dipping your toe in. You're kind of jumping in head first. And I was kind of like on the fence of whether or not I should do that. But I felt like his narrative was so compelling. If I could just smack you in the face with quite possibly the nuttiest story that there is, and you, you know, are still here in your seat with your headphones on, mm. then maybe you'll then you'll definitely finish the series. Interesting. And that was kind of like a, I'm like, am I going to spook everybody? But I made sure, I, like, I tried my best to have like this really sort of like objective approach to it, where I wasn't taking it or myself too seriously, and so it felt like a little, you know, soft handed. And it was, you know, I would say like, yeah, that's that sounds crazy. Like, mm-hmm. I would probably say what you're thinking if you thought it was crazy. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where those stories end or if they're all true or not. But I do believe that there are, you know, crafts in the sky that aren't from Earth. And that's been happening for a while. Really? I do believe that, yeah. Which crafts specifically? What, what reports do you think aren't from Earth? I mean, there's tons that, like, I could reference. But I would say, I think that the, the Tic Tac stories are definitely something not from earth if if we're believing the accounts of the navy pilots and um you know everyone else in the military who was genuinely spooked and perplexed by this i if we're believing them then i think that there's your there's your biggest account there's also way better footage of those things and right. i don't know why they won't release that i mean Maybe it's, you know, top secret, whatever. If it's a fucking balloon, who cares? But I don't think it's well, a balloon. Well, I think if it's a balloon or if it's some sort of technology that we're developing secretly, that's why we wouldn't want to release it. I think that's a good reason to keep it secret. It's always a possibility that what we're seeing sometimes is, you know, our own stuff or even it's an adversary. It, even if it's an adversary, I think that would be a good reason to release it, right? To to put this out there so people see what it is so we can start getting more reports of it and to expose this sort of technology that we don't understand if it's something that we really don't know what it is. But if it's something that we have and we're secretly developing it and we don't want other nations to know about, I would imagine that would be a great reason to keep it secret and not to release the actual good, compelling footage of it. But then you would, if you're going to go with that theory, then you'd have to add the anecdote of, well, they lied to us then. Because they said they don't know what they are. But that's what the government does. They lie to us. <laughs> I mean, sure. But like, at what point do you believe them now? Or do you believe them then? Or you believe them this time? Right. You can't. You never you know, know. What's like. You never know. That's a bold statement. So that's either, 
either the person you know that was you know like, approved that statement believes that is true mm. or there's some other like deep dark like small black operation that would you know that's going on that like is developing technology that like our smartest f-18 pilots don't know about there which, definitely is that definitely exists sure it, it, but like to what end as well like right. it, like do we think that they're do like we've reached the point where we can do stuff that these f-18s can't like you know seemingly defy laws of physics mm -hmm. with things have we gone there i i don't know but that would also have to be one more asterisk with that way of thinking of mm. that they're all ours which who knows what they are but they're not what we're used to seeing there's so many different and they go back a long time right and that to me is also odd that's very odd. When you go back to the 50s, mm -hmm. then you start to get freaky. To me, those are the most compelling cases. Yeah. Because you can go back, like, as a researcher, and you can look up, like, literally what happened that day. Right. And we know exactly where technology was mm. to a point. Right. <clears throat> it's a Kodak film picture that wasn't Photoshopped. Right. So what the hell is that thing? Yeah, I think if anything, I think the sightings and the videos and the accounts from the, like the 50s and the 60s could be definitely alien. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the new stuff, I just don't know. I don't trust the people that got us into the Iraq war under false pretenses. Yeah, it's, it's harder to believe technology. that stuff now when you yeah. see it, <laughs> like even if it's super compelling. Have you seen, um, you can find, I don't know if you've seen the article yet, but there's an article posted on Warzone where the uh, the journalist, Tyler, I forget his last name, he found out the, uh, have you ever heard, I gotta give some context. Have you ever heard of Ryan Graves, the Navy fighter pilot who recounts seeing these objects on his radar? On his yeah, 18? I actually spoke to him on on the High Strange podcast. Okay, mm -hmm. um, he recounts seeing this thing, or not him seeing it, but he saw it on his radar. But one of the guys that he was flying with saw a something he described as a cube inside of a sphere. Mm -hmm. Yep, you remember that? Yep. What do you think about that? Um, that's just weird. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, like my reaction to that when he, you know, described that to us for the podcast was like, I'm going to text you something, Jordan. That sounds yeah. like, you know, oddly specific. Right. And it's like, you know, you have this sort of trope idea, this Hollywood image in your head from all the, you know, sci-fi movies over generations that it's this flying saucer all the time and not something that is maybe none of those things at all. Like what would that be i don't know like you could speculate but like it doesn't sound like a craft also sounds like nothing we've ever had ever so like is it like a energy thing is it like a mm. portal like is it like a, a drone that looks really cool like i don't know yeah so so this article that was done by this guy on the war zone he basically discovered the patent mm. that was i think approved in the 80s i think um uh, for a radar deflecting device mm. that is basically propelled into the atmosphere does it look like it via a submarine and it's it's a balloon with a um a radar deflector inside go down you can actually see the diagram for the pilot. oh weird yeah so it's a tetrahedron is that the right word but it can easily be mistaken for a cube if you're flying by it really fast. Yeah, I mean, it looks kind of similar. And they were they were developed during the Cold War, and they were actually tested over Cuba. So why would these things be floating out here now, right, in exactly. their airspace without their knowing? Right, and the interesting thing is, is that they only started seeing them once they upgraded their radar equipment yeah. in their F-18s. Yes. So they could essentially be testing their own stuff on their own radar. Cause they, it's, it's sure, interesting. yeah, like it was deflecting the radar. It was working on the old radar. When they when they upgraded, instantly they started seeing them. Yeah, we're not going to tell you it's there. You tell us if you see anything right. as like the test of... Scroll yeah. down. It actually shows you everything about the patent. So can you zoom in on that? Is there Are there any images of the real thing? US, US patent number... Two four six three five one seven titled Airborne Corner Reflector. Interesting. Yeah, you can do a deep dive on all of this stuff. It's literally on US, USPTO. Yeah, and you never know. Like it, it, it could totally just be this thing, right? Um, something that we do, don't have much knowledge of. Mm -hmm. That is not alien, but foreign enough to spook a a Navy fighter pilot. <laughs> right. So that what they were doing was they were deploying these things from submarines. 
mm. over over Cuba. And then they were like shooting like phony radar signals, trying to confuse to Soviet, scramble stuff to and scramble like, Soviet radar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During the Cold War, that's wild. That's a good find. Um, so there's lots of things, man. I I don't know. Ever since the Tic Tac and the and this thing, I just have been super skeptical that you know this is. And then the recent thing that came out um, a couple of days ago that that pilot shot over. I, what what was that recent one, Jordan? Where was that? That was like in Venezuela or somewhere like that. Oh, the Colombian one. Colombia. That was where. It oh was. yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does look cool. I'll give them that. I don't think that shit is aliens. I think I think that's got to be our technology. And maybe it is, but that's a uh, that's a very UFO looking thing, <laughs> right? They didn't. Yeah. It. They well, made it look like uh, we want them to look like. Then. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a manta ray. Or a disc flying. I don't like, think like that it's like a traditional balloon because I, I feel like it would move differently if a plane passes it like that. Yeah. How, um, how or, fast is that plane going? Like 100 miles an hour? I think so. Something like That's, that. How fast would something be if you're driving on the highway and you passed a sign? How fast would it be going compared to... If you play that back again? It, see, it doesn't seem to be moving very fast. Yeah, so I plane. don't think it is moving very fast. It, yeah. it Optically, it appears that way, but it's not. Right. But I think it is moving. Um, right. Yeah. It could be it's moving. just also super high up there. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, maybe it's not an alien spaceship, but I don't think it's a balloon that flew away from the Party City parking lot either. No. You know, else it's super high up there. And it looks like a, a craft, like a, a thing mm -hmm. that does something. Um, so, yeah. So that to me is either like some advanced balloon or like, Technology. The thing is, there's shit that we don't know what it looks like that that we are currently developing. Just like that mm -hmm. example I just showed you, that thing that there's a the literal U.S. patent on that no one has ever seen before, and these fighter pilots didn't even weren't even aware that this, these things existed. So, how do you kind of I guess rationalize why there is a UAP task force? Why do anybody in the or does anybody in the government? feel like it's an important thing to explore these unknown objects in the sky that have been ruled out pretty much everywhere else. Well, if it just was total bullshit. My theory evolves almost weekly on this, but right now I think it's a limited hangout. Limited hangout. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I think basically it's just, that's, I guess, dumb CIA. It's, club. it's CIA jargon mm -hmm. for just a distraction. We're going to give you sure. a, a little bit of truth here to distract everybody from what's really going on. And what's really going on, you think? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's secret projects that we have going on through stuff like DARPA or Skunk Works that mm -hmm. we're developing and that we're testing that we don't want foreign entities to know about. So is I, your feeling that none of them would be something otherworldly? I don't I, I don't know, but the the more shit that comes out, like all these crazy acronym task force, right. with all these people talking about it and people making careers on this stuff. And I, I the more shit that comes out about it and the more headlines I see in the New York Times, the more I start to lean towards limited hangout and that it's just a distraction. Yeah, false, I mean false flag. I just don't like instinctually like to give give the government too much credit. Mm. I don't think that they're that smart. I don't think that they're smart enough to plot this whole like, you know, deep campaign to make you look over here and do this. I think that they're not that smart. They've done it. They've attempted to do that before, but they also didn't succeed. So it's like when did they attempt to just like Project Blue Book stuff? Mm -hmm. Like you know, like sure, some people uh, were probably affected by their misinformation campaigns, and you know, thinking that you know, you you were loony or you're crazy if you saw something in the sky that you thought was an alien spaceship. But like people never stopped thinking that. Really, some mm -hmm. people did, but like it's like what is the at what point is it like is something true? Like, even if it's 0.1%, the universe is so big, it's like, it, it wouldn't be impossible for it to have happened. Definitely not. And so it's kind of, so with that in mind, it's hard to kind of, I guess, break down the things that we see here on Earth 
but it's something that's been talked about for literally centuries. Like yeah. as as far as you go back in history, they're describing shit like people still describe they see in the sky. Right. And so like you go back far enough, none of those things existed. Right. We weren't even flying planes yet. So definitely. And so there's no doubt that they're that the government has some pretty cool badass stuff up their sleeve. I don't know if it's, if but, it's stuff that you know, I don't know if it's stuff that they've we've developed on our own. If it's stuff that we've found that we've sort of re, reverse engineered, sure, or yeah. like figured out how to use. Maybe it could be both. I don't know where the truth. How do you feel lies. about that whole theory of? Because that's kind of the the, the low key rumblings around. Uh, you know, other journalists that I've talked to, there there's a common there's this common knowledge or idea that the government has. Uh, like alien spacecraft and they're reverse engineering it. I think it's totally possible. Yeah. I think it's totally possible. And they're doing a damn good job of keeping it secret. Yeah, because I, I think that for that to be such a big secret, I don't think that many people know about it. I don't think that they're sitting up there, you know, Congress or whatever, you know, lying through their teeth. I think that they just don't know. I think mm -hmm. that there's a little like private company that a few people know about. Yeah. There's a company called Battelle. Is that, is that what it's called? Is yeah, it the, one in Vegas? Or? There's a, no, no. There's a company called B A T T E L L E. If you look it up, they uh, they have most of these contracts. Okay. To, to oh yeah. Work, to work on these things, I actually just recently. Are they learned, rumored to be one of the ones that? I I just learned about Battelle recently through another podcast I did. But these guys. Um, have some of these mm -hmm. crazy futuristic anti-gravity um contracts oh cool and like even even like light photon tra like propulsion shit like stuff that you right. can't wrap your mind around yeah 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 that they're doing and it's all it's all that's badass based on based on national security and war man i hope they're doing that because that'd be pretty damn cool my friend, the guy who was just on here, he recently went to the UAP that hearing a couple of days ago, and he was yeah. talking to one of the congresswomen about this, and she had never even heard about Battelle. And he was like talking to her about it, trying to like explain it and teach her about it. And she's hmm. like, oh, we got to go there. I never heard of this before. And it's crazy, because this is like one of the <laughs> longest standing like- Yeah, like you maybe, you maybe should have heard of this one. Yeah. I'm on the fence about it. I don't know. What do you, what do you think about Bob Lazar? So um, to me, Bob Lazar is so frustrating. Um, for two reasons. Uh, one, if he's lying, why are we still talking about it today? That's annoying that he's still like, it feels like there's still some gray area there. And two, if it's true that we're considering the fact that he's lying, because if he's telling the truth, it's like, damn, that's all the information you ever wanted to know about like UFOs and Area 51 is right there. My biggest problem with Lazar He's a very believable guy when you hear yes, him talk. Very believable. He seems nice. Mm -hmm. You want to believe him. Mm -hmm. But the whole college thing, I can't let it go. The fact that he lied about where he went to college. And it's like, if you're someone like me who's gone and, you know, investigated a, a cold murder case, these would be red flags in someone's character. And if you lied about this, where do your lies stop? He has. To my knowledge, no one's ever asked him outright why he's lied about his background. And I would just love to know his response. Maybe he'd have a really good response, but I, I can't imagine what it would be that would make me feel better. I think mm -hmm. that... Well, he would have a good reason to lie about MIT, right? Because MIT has a lot of secret programs. Yeah, but like he's not in the yearbooks. The teachers that he named were like right. teachers somewhere right. else. Right, that's true. And it's like, okay, like, we're talking about, like, a long time ago. Mm. They didn't just scrub you from, like, the digital database. Right. Like, are you implying that they, like, erased you? Well, someone there would remember you. Anybody, right? And mm. the fact that there's nobody, I think that he just said a lie one time a long time ago in the 90s, in not really thinking about, you know, what we'd be saying 30 right. years in, from now. Right. And I think he just avoids it at all costs. And that makes me question everything else about his story. Mm. Yeah. For for me, the thing is Jeremy Corbell really kind of like ruins it for me. When I saw his, he, How so? he ruined it for me specifically when he debated Stanton Friedman 
about it. And Stan Friedman is a legendary physicist. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're, I highly recommend that watching that debate on YouTube. It's fascinating. You haven't seen it, yeah. Stan Friedman questions him on the uh, the degrees too, and he goes, "Why did he lie about this stuff?" And I think Jeremy's response was, "Come on, man, haven't you haven't you ever lied to try to get a chick before?" Okay. Um, and and he made the case like, "Look, we've made multiple offers to to Bob. I don't know. I think that interview was close to seven years ago. That debate I was ref- I'm referring to, and uh, Stanton said that like, look, we've reached out to him many times." offered to debate him on it, to talk to him about it. He won't talk to anyone that knows anything about physics. He'll only mm. talk to layman people about this stuff. He'll only talk to George Knapp, Joe Rogan, people that aren't physics, don't have physics backgrounds and don't understand physics language. Right. So you're saying like the the physics in what he's presenting don't necessarily make sense according to another physicist. Though, That's right? what Stanton was saying. Which would still and be an opinion versus a, an opinion. It's not like this guy is like, hey, I've built one of these things and that's not how you do it. Right. And that's what Eric Weinstein is saying too. I mean, Eric Weinstein publicly uh, reached out and offered to debate him or to even have a conversation with him about this stuff. And, I wish that would happen. And, and that, he's yeah. never done it. He's never talked. There's no documented That bothers evidence. me. Yeah. I don't like that. Right. You know. And, it, and the other weird thing to me too is he's always had a handler. Like before he had John Lear or a Gene Huff rather, the mm-hmm. John Lear story is weird too. Yeah. But the Gene Huff thing and now Jeremy Corbell, like anywhere he goes, even if it's on Larry King or Rogan yep. or whatever, he's always got this person right here to basically like fill in the gaps for him. And I, I actually, I, I know Jeremy Corbell personally. I've, I, I've never asked him straight up about the Lazar college thing, but now I want to. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I really would rather ask Lazar himself. Like yeah. I, I want to know not what Jeremy says or this person says in response. I want to like look someone in the eye and ask them a hard question and see what they say. Right. Because that like that's the linchpin to me in most of Bob Lazar's story and I can't really reason with the idea that well maybe that part he lied about but the rest he didn't. I uh, no. And then there's the fact that he got a job at Area 51, right? So mm-hmm. he got a job at Area 51 right after his wife killed herself and he married somebody else also like days before his wife committed suicide. Yeah, he's a weird dude you do with a, a bad, weird history. If you're going to work at the most top secret fucking base in the United States of America, you don't think that that would be a red flag into hiring you? Yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to see why he was the best pick for those kinds of reasons. Like... Wouldn't you try to avoid situations like that? Absolutely. They would never fucking hire somebody whose wife committed suicide. Unless there was some other motive to and it. And there was also the tie to the Hell's Angels that his wife had. That she went to pr- she went to jail because of some sort of something happened with the Hell's Angels. Yeah, there's all, all kind of weird stuff with like his personal life that's and then, odd. And the other thing is Jeremy Corbell's documentary. I don't know if this is right. This is what I've heard from multiple people, multiple people in red. So take it for yeah. what it's worth. But um, in the beginning of his film, where they're talking about the FBI raiding him mm-hmm. for having Element 115, yep. apparently that was there was a FOIA done on that FBI raid, and it was mm-hmm. specifically because somebody just bought some sort of chemical from United Nuclear and used it to murder their somebody like their wife or something. Yes, that's that is true. And they basically so Jeremy admitted that was that was true. He made that up. No, no, that is that is actually true. That that there was a murder investigation. Right. But I, I actually do still find this one a little bit odd. Mm. Um, maybe, like, why are they going, pulling out all the stops? Like, I would love to know exactly how they pinpointed this specific element and tracked it all the way to Bob Lazar. That's a convenient, you know, person to track it to if if anything he's saying is true. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't really know what happened with that. I mean, he didn't go to jail for that. Right. But, um... Like you could easily look at that as like a, a a good excuse to go raid his place or just to fuck with him, ruffle his feathers. Um, yeah. It's just still weird. Like it's like you guys still care about this guy or something, or what are the chances that he gets wrapped up in some weird murder investigation? But no, everything's good though. Mm. But you know, I don't I don't know one who's been house has been raided for some element that they have. Well, How do they even track that It was him? just a chemical somebody bought, like a common chemical somebody used to kill their wife. And it was, the guy literally bought it from his website, and that's why. Okay. Apparently. Allegedly. Then why isn't he in prison for that? 
Because it's not illegal to sell the chemical just because you sell bleach. So what were they looking for? Uh, I forget. I don't know what the name of the chemical was, but I guess they were looking for... Maybe you can find it. I don't think they, they even said what they were looking for, but they, I mean, the murder investigation is why they were there, is what they said. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, what were they looking for exactly? Well, that's that? a good point. Like, if you bought bleach from Ace Hardware and you went and Looking for more bleach? I don't know. Like, why, what? why is the FBI going to raid Ace Hardware? That's what I'm saying. It, maybe because maybe, maybe he's... Maybe they just needed to prove that he sold it or something? I don't know. Maybe... But like, what would they have needed? Like a physical he, printout of something? Like, and, and here's here's another question I have about him. Um, if he is this whistleblower, right? Mm-hmm. If he blew the whistle on this most the government's one of the government's most top secret programs in history. Yeah. Why is Cor? Why is Jeremy on that interview or that debate with Stanton Friedman bragging about how Bob still has all these federal government contracts with the company United Nuclear? That's think, a good, I don't like know. Edward Snowden, does he have any government contracts? Do to, to, to any of these other whistleblowers no, get uh, government contracts? I don't think so. No, they're ready to scoop that guy up whenever they could. Right. Yeah. So if he is this whistleblower on the government prog- program, why would the government still be doing these secret government contracts with him? Yeah. What, what is he even doing? Or what is he even saying he's doing with them? Jeremy, you, do, you have to pull up the interview, but Jeremy yeah. Corbell is basically, pull up the Jeremy Corbell Stan Freeman interview, but he says it multiple times during the interview that he's doing all kinds of crazy cutting edge science based uh, studies for the government, for secret government programs. Yeah, it's like, it's one of those things where, you know, everything can't be true. Like, it's not, like, it can't all be true. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at Bizarre, or Bizarre, Lazar through that lens, it's yeah, like, it. same thing. Like, it can't all be true. Yeah. Bob Lazar, during your talk, and your I don't remember where it is. Case, Maybe go like a quarter not, of the way through. Now that we had that, case, he has said, "Great, that's going to be." Was well, let's see. I have his file. He graduated in August, not with his class. That usually means you failed a course, you know. Okay, uh, he took a lot of science courses, didn't he? She says chemistry. What else? Chemistry. Okay. Was he valedictorian well, it, of his it class? It doesn't mean you failed the course. It may be you just took, you didn't take a class and do the required credits. That's again a, a, a thing that doesn't quite make sense. But let, like, I feel you. Let, let me continue. finish it. Yeah. Uh, he, he didn't have any other science courses. Then I asked, was he valedictorian? No. She laughed. He's talking about his high school teacher. And I have to give you the background why I asked that question. I was valedictorian in my high school class in Linden, New Jersey, 1951, a long time ago, and I was accepted at MIT, except I couldn't afford to go. Tuition was 950 bucks. What is it, 27,000 now? <laughs> so I resented the kind of uh, implication that this guy had graduated from one of the top schools in the country, and, and MIT qualifies. Was he in the top 10 in his class? No. Oh, maybe they're talking about MIT. No. Oh, God. Now she's laughing. Top 100? No. (laughs) He was like 265 out of 366, which is the bottom third. Okay, but can we cut to the chase here? Well, he's getting to The point is that the notion that he went to MIT doesn't stand up. Nobody could find him in a yearbook. None of five people there I talked to, including the registrar, had any connection with him. And he was in the bottom third of his class. And MIT admissions office says you got to be in the top 20%. If they'll, they'll bend if it's more than 15, you know. Uh, he, so, you know, his, he was lying about having gone to MIT. I'd called Caltech. They never heard of him. He was asked in Rachel, Nevada, home of the infamous little alien, to name some of his professors. He said, uh, let's see, Bill Duxler will remember me from Caltech Physics. I looked in my directory, there's Bill Duxler, I called him. He never taught at Caltech, only at Pierce Junior College, which is a long way intellectually, if not geologically, from uh, Caltech. (laughs) He checked, uh, Bob had taken a course under him at the very same time when he was supposedly at MIT, 2,500 miles away. And if you can go to MIT, you don't go to Pierce Junior College. Right. So we've got some dissimulation. Is that a good word? I'd mm-hmm. love to say something about that. <laughs> can Jeremy speak to that now, or do you have Sure. Well, I've well, got something go back else. And forth, man. You know, you got to give me a second. You know, you say something. Okay. So, like, basically, 
let's just get to the crux of it. The crux of it is none of this is really the point. I mean, really the point is how did he know that, go ahead and clap, that's a good one, Bob, that's for you. None of this is really the point. Okay, the point is this, um, you know, how did Bob know that on Wednesday over Papoose Dry Lake that there'd be something- I didn't say he wasn't So there. anyway, you don't have to watch the whole thing, but it's, it's just really ever compelling. really defend the college thing or no no he earlier in this interview when he's tra he's asking him about it again his his verbatim response was haven't you ever lied to get a chick uh, okay so so jeremy seems like he he's he knows that is weird and it's not a good look for him but he's just oh, he's just he just doesn't want to looking talk about past it, it he's right? looking past it right okay. he's kind of accepted like maybe bob lied but i don't yeah, care I, I have a hard time looking past that yeah um yeah i, I do and then there was another college called Pacifica University that was convicted and they they got shut down because they were allegedly uh, a degree mill. They were selling degrees and he had a degree from that place too. <laughs> there, there's so many crazy stories. Yeah, it's so like many... why is he have this kind of convincing narrative and he's a believable, yeah. nice looking guy and all these weird parts of his past. Mm -hmm. You can't overlook that stuff if you're trying to figure out if someone's telling the truth or not. Right. But I mean... If I'm Jeremy Corbell, I'm, I'm willing to avoid the truth to tell a great story to, and to create a great documentary because it is and a it's great a, And it's, it's, a a hell of a, it's a hell of a story. Yeah. You know, it's like a part of you wants it to be true. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And there's so, I mean, and then the, he left out John Lear and he left out Gene Huff, which is really interesting. I don't know why he left those guys out because those guys were really important parts of the story. I mean, bought, John Lear was literally like the, the, the beginning of this whole thing. Yeah, I wish I could sit down with Bob Lazar and, and ask him these kind of questions mm. and just see what the response is and really kind of have a conversation about everything and be able to make my own personal assessment that probably won't ever happen but hey Bob if you're listening it's on the table it'd be well, it'd be cool yeah well listening to all of his interviews man I, I was sold I was completely sold on very on believable his body language the way he talked about shit yeah that's that's like that's the annoying part. Mm -hmm. He's like, I just like he. It seems like he's telling the truth. Yeah. You want to believe the guy, but you can't overlook obvious things. You can't, or they need to be addressed head on. Right. Like if Bob Lazar told me that, look, dude, I lied because of X Y Z, I might buy that actually. But okay, I still think that it, it was weird. But if you're gonna like dodge it or seemingly dodge the question. And not just come out and say, hey, like, all this shit I said is true. This part isn't. I'm sorry. But, like, mm -hmm. this part's still true. Like, I feel like there's a... You should you should do that if um, you're him. Yeah. I feel like the next big documentary has to be, like, somebody that actually blows the Bob Lazar story out of the water. Because, you know, the story of Bob Lazar has been told, mm -hmm. right? It's been done. It's the biggest podcast that Joe Rogan ever did. There's mm -hmm. a freaking incredible documentary that Jeremy made. Um, somebody has to like look at it and really pick it apart and convince people. It's going to be hard to do. I, I think he's kind of elusive like that. It seems like he has a small circle. Mm -hmm. um, but there's people around him, I think, that could know. Yeah, I think so too. But, but what you need, though, is is Lazar's responses to the hard questions. Right. Like that. I'm, right. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, exactly. Even for, for me, for every other listener or viewer, like... It'll be very telling if he never does that. If he never takes the opportunity to talk oh, to somebody absolutely. who understands physics. Then I, yeah, then I can't, like, wholeheartedly believe anything if in, until that's done. Right. You know, that that and that's the thing, like, getting back to the beginning of this conversation is, like, once you start to kind of gain this freedom of creating whatever you want and posting it online and being able to be like an independent free creator basically just reporting whatever's interesting to you like you have to remember not to just lean into things because you get the money or because you get the clicks on it Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people do yeah. that and it's extremely obvious when people start to just lean in and lean in and lean in until they've completely forgotten who they were. I mean, the news does that every damn day. Yeah. It's like every headline, every click, every, you mm -hmm. know, YouTube uh, thumbnail. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. everyone is about the clicks. Um, you know, you can't do that. You can't operate with that mentality if you're truly objectively investigating anything. Right. You really can't. Doesn't mean that you don't 
button it up and make it sexy and make it, you know, something premium that mm. you trust or enjoy, but you cannot fall for the bullshit because right. then you're putting out bullshit. Right. And you can't not just fall for the bullshit. You can't fall for your own bullshit. For your own bullshit. And just try just because you're seeing so much success in one thing or one narrative. Oh, so that's complete, cheap. That's low. That's. Uh, I don't know if you. I don't know if you follow sports at all, but yeah. like m- the greatest example, the greatest modern example of this to me is Skip Bayless. Oh God, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. What he has become over the years from being a sports reporter to just being this fucking clown talking head. It's just, bizarre. It's so obvious how fake his narratives are and how he just does that because it's part of a. It's part of a show. That yeah, he's like, d- on. D- like the hating little like LeBron, like LeBron right. shit, like. Right. That blows my mind. I'm like, right. is this just a gag or what? It is. It's so. It's so. Also, like LeBron's corny. really fucking good. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's so obviously just a fabricated narrative that he's created. This just he's created this giant labyrinth of people that love to hate him. Yep. And he's seen so much success. That's his from thing. Him. He just leans into it, and he doesn't want to try to challenge his own beliefs anymore he's just gonna keep leaning into it just keep saying that and saying more of that and doubling down on that and distorting that even more and going further and further down that rabbit hole right when you know it could have been something else right and i see a lot of that in the in the ufo topic man i like i like to see more i like to see more of an open conversation Mm -hmm. about it i like to see more more people talking about it and making content on it like you are and other Mm -hmm. people are like i even am but um I think that's good. I think that's good that people are doing it that. It needs and that. Building an economy around it. I think that's important. But, um, you know, at the same time, I hate grifters. I hate to see grifters. There's just been, I mean, like all the, most of the content over the years in the UFO space has been really geared and targeted towards believers of something. Mm. You know, fans of UFOs and aliens. And I right. get it, right? It's like, it is fun. But, you know, at what point do we try to have a, a healthy, realistic conversation? You can't just target the people who are already going to talk about it. Mm. We need to expand the conversation. We need more people in this room. Yeah. And that was one of my goals with High Strange was to, you know, try to expand or elevate the conversation, push it forward in any way at all. Where if you were someone who wasn't thinking very open-minded about really anything that you maybe maybe you're a little bit more open-minded about anything because the reality is i don't know what's true and what's not true Mm -hmm. i don't but i also know that we don't know everything yet you know we learn so much every day you just look back in history it's very obvious um i think that we forget that sometimes that we're still learning and there's something to all of this I, I believe that and someone else may not believe that that's fine but you should still be in the conversation mm. have you seen uh, James Fox's new documentary moment of contact no I heard it's good though oh my god is it good fucking amazing yeah that's it's, on the list it's one of the best documentaries on this topic I've seen in a long time probably since the phenomenon I'm, he's his work is incredible damn yeah no I'm, I'm pumped for that but there was like literal there's like hundreds of witnesses in this little town in Virginia Brazil that saw a live alien running mm-hmm. around the town yeah another story yeah so what do you make of that story though I think that one's real <laughs> right some of them you're like well, well what was it though there's no way all of these people came out and talked about this these military people these cops these and those sisters or whatever school like girls that yeah, were walking what, home what's from their school? incentive to right. totally fabricate this thing all the people i mean he had so much he had to do so much work and convincing to convince to get these people to go on camera and talk isn't there allegedly like a video of it like rumored to there exist is. but is, it's, yeah. you know, where is it though i don't know right there is a bit well the, the what happened right after this is that apparently these quote unquote men in black came and started knocking on people's door, offering them money and basically saying, you know, I hope you and your kids have a long and healthy life. Here's some money we're going to offer you and uh, let us know if you need anything. Weird. So like weird sort of like intimidation tactics that were being done by people that seem to be Americans, according to these people in Brazil. Mm, yeah. I mean, there was a military response yeah, to the, the whole thing. The U.S. Which Air Force also landed kinda, there the next day, yeah. Also kind of odd, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, what are you doing? Why are y'all doing all this if it's absolutely nothing? Right. You and, know? And um, what is the lady's name? The, the New York Times reporter. 
Leslie Kane? Leslie Kane, yeah. Mm-hmm. She just came, was on video a couple of days ago, confirmed, she said that she talked to some of her sources in the government, I guess in the Pentagon, and they, her sources, according to her, said that the story is true. Really? Yeah. That's that's pretty pretty big. That's pretty fucking and big. And I, I know Leslie pretty well. I've, Do you really? I've interviewed her a few times um, for High Strange, and she's a, she's a, a, a straight shooter, really. Like, mm. And she has spent a, a lifetime developing pretty strong relationships with people. So, I mean, if, if Leslie's saying she heard that, I believe that she did hear that. Yeah. Find that Leslie Kane. Uh, it's like a three second. It's like a five second video of her talking about that. It's while she's sitting next to James while he's, tell, he's telling the story about this. And I want to see the video, man. If, if it exists, I hope we get to see it one day. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, to, like another thing is like the crashed flying saucer thing seems so bizarre to me. Like, how do they crash this thing? If they're so advanced, how are they crashing it? And this and this fucking living entity or, or a biological, biologically engineered creature is here. Like yeah, we've crashed our planes and, like an and lived. Yeah, and right. Travis of Barker survived a plane crash and he's drumming his right. brains out. So, right. I think it's possible. I think that it's like I don't think that because you could be so technologically advanced or something that there isn't some element of error. Mm-hmm. I don't think they meant to crash. If they've, ever, if they've ever actually crashed here, I guarantee you they were like, oh shit, we fucked up. Leslie Keene, James Fox. Um, just type that in, see if that comes up. Click on videos. I might have seen this on Twitter. There it is, uh, that one. Yep. I would love Leslie to talk about what she's been, if you wouldn't mind. Turn it up. Give me some more volume. I just, I don't want to push the envelope here. So if I'm going to say something that's going to make you uncomfortable, you tell me. (laughs) Because she reached into some deep people that deep, deep in her back pocket that made some confirmations for her. It took James 20 or like 12 or 15 years to make this documentary. Jeez. 15 years. I mean, that's incredible. You know, I did speak to a number of people, you know, with high clearances or been been in this issue for years and years and years, some of the insiders that I consult with. And, and I mean, it basically they verified that this happened. It, you know, it's a movie like that comes out. You could see all kinds of people reacting and saying, what are you, crazy? Something, creatures? You know, no, it's the opposite. These insiders were confirming this. Um, so that was really exciting, really exciting, and it's great for James. He's like, to get yes, <laughs> um, told you. And, and the fact that there there was U.S. involvement and most likely uh, debris and even bodies from that case reside now in the United States. Um, I'm not able to find out where. I can't get that information, but never give up. Um, <laughs> and I also wanted to say about the medical. I mean, I was able to talk to um, uh, this doctor in um brazil who he didn't actually perform no he he was uh, the doctor of shirinji when he was in the hospital and um so he knew a lot about what caused his death and uh, the autopsy report was really interesting because of the nature of the microorganisms that were found on him which have all kinds of suggestive components of coming from some kind of a non-human creature and i still have to do more more work on that but it's very evidential that's the thing that I wish we had more information on was the toxin that killed, uh, I believe it was Marco Sherizzi. I don't, I'm not sure about that one. I think that could have been basically they killed him because they didn't want him to talk. Which one was that one? He was the guy, he was the cop who actually handled the alien. And oh yeah, and he, got, and he, he got messed up from it or something? Yeah, he yeah. literally died like less than 24 hours later of complete immune system shutdown. Mm-hmm. There are, I mean, dozens of stories kind of similar to that where there's like, you know, they, you know, people claiming that if you get too close to something or you know, there's something n- unsafe for humans mm-hmm. uh, with certain types of interactions with either UAP or extraterrestrials. I mean, the military was even looking like into that, studying that like as part of their... Really? Yeah, that was uh, in their, I mean, their previous, uh, the one that Louis, Lou Elizondo was a part of whatever they want to call it now, I don't know. But um, yeah, they were you know, researching UFOs and part of their study was into like if they've harmed us or in, in instances mm-hmm. where people have claimed that they ex- experienced some sort of 
harm or, you know, even, you know, like sexual encounters and stuff like that. Mm. Like they were legitimately exploring these kinds of claims. And I mean, I feel like that would just be a tremendous waste of time and money if there is zero chance that it's any of it's true. Right. Unless they're just big sci-fi buffs. I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy, man. There's so much to it. There's so much to it. And I wish I, uh, you know, I don't know. Like I said before, the more I see big publications talking about it mm -hmm. that have ties to the Pentagon and the Pentagon releasing stuff, and the, the more I get suspicious. And also the more Annie Jacobson books I read, the way it's, the more suspicious I become. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy just to like fall down yeah. into this mess, this web mm -hmm. of like yeah. complete nonsense. I mean, it, it all stems from we, we just don't definitively know anything, right? right? Like yeah. we don't definitively know enough to mm -hmm. stop racking your brain on it. And if you rack your brain too hard on anything, you, drive yourself crazy. you might enter the conspiracy land or right. the, you know, uh, some nonsense might come spewing out of your mouth before right. you, before you know it. Right. Well, I love the uh, I love the quote that what's the difference between the truth and a conspiracy theory? It's six months. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true though. <laughs> uh, dude. Well, thank you, Yen, for doing this. I had fun. Dude, that was awesome, man. Thank you for having me out here. Uh, I guess tell people where they can find your podcast and follow you online and all that stuff. Yeah. So I'm Payne Lindsay. My social media, Instagram, Twitter is just at Payne Lindsay. And my new podcast that investigates the UFO phenomenon in American history is called High Strange. It's an eight-part series. It's available now wherever you listen to your podcast. Sounds fascinating, man. Thanks again. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Hell yeah, man. Cheers. Good night, everybody. <laughs>